Right, okay, it is uh, 1300 Brussels time. And uh, I would like to welcome you to the European Trade Union Institute's um, annual Occupational Safety and Health Conference. Uh, my name is Paula Franklin and I work as a senior researcher here at the ETUI. And before we start the actual conference, I would like to make just a few practical announcements. Uh, first, uh, please double check uh, if you have access to interpretation. You can move your mouse over the bottom of the, this uh, Zoom screen and there should be this Zoom menu that appears. There we, we will notice a globe icon and if you click on the icon, you will see the different interpretation languages we have for you today. These are English, French, Spanish, German, Portuguese and Czech Slovak. If you cannot see uh, the different languages, uh, it probably means that you need to download the latest version of Zoom and restart your computer. Uh, the link to download the latest Zoom version will appear in the chat box of this meeting to, to assist you. Now, if you are experiencing any technical problems during the, the conference, you can send a chat message uh, to panelists. Uh, please only use the chat for technical problems. And note that the chat function does not have interpretation, so you should be typing in, in English if you need um, any technical support. Um, if you have a question or a remark uh, concerning the content, please do not use the chat, but use Q and A, so the questions and answers function of Zoom. Now, the conference will be recorded and posted online later. Um, we, we have the, the conference runs over two days, so this afternoon and tomorrow morning. And this afternoon, we have uh, two sessions. Uh, first one is on the relationship between occupational safety and health and public health, which is a topic that has emerged uh, quite strongly during the pandemic times. And the second session is uh, concerning psychosocial risks in telework. But without further ado, I will now pass the floor uh, to Klaas Mikael Stoll, who is the ETUC Deputy General Secretary, as well as Maria Skarpman, the ETUI Head of Unit for OSH and Working Conditions, who will officially open the conference. Uh, Klaas Mikael, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, I must say that I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted and thankful to, to be here today. Of course, I wished, like, like all of us, that it had been a physical meeting of, or, or, of, or, and we could have met in person, but, but it is what it is at these times, of course. And as I said, I'm delightful uh, to have this opportunity to talk with you today. And, and I'm going to use my time by talking about some major challenges and opportunities for trade unions and OSH as a whole, as I see them. And I think that OSH issues are at the center uh, at a number of key conflicts and political battles where we find ourselves today. The first one uh, that I'm going to spend most time is the ideological ones that concerns our, I would even use words like war, but, but struggles with right-wing populism and neoliberalism. The second one is the pandemic and concerns the key role that OSH will have in fighting back COVID-19. However, I will be quite short there because I think that there's going to be plenty of discussion and time for you to discuss those issues by yourself. And the importance of our struggle with right-wing populism struck me like a lightning really uh, last week when I was in a meeting with our American friends at AFL-CIO on the new trade negotiations that we have now between the EU and the United States. And I was also, I should mention that in that context, promoting OSH uh, as an area to be specifically addressed within those negotiations and that would maybe bring OSH to, to an even new level uh, in, in, in international affairs. Anyway, in the talks we had, it soon became clear that the Biden administration and AFL-CIO felt very pressured. 
And as they said, we got one year to make a difference. That's what they said. We need to fight back Trumpism before the midterms elections. And that made me think about our political condition in Europe. Did we fight back right-wing populism? Or did right-wing populism disappear just because Macron won the French election in 2017? Or because Alternative for Deutschland fall back in the German elections earlier this year? We tend to forget things that never happened. And maybe that's, that's a good thing uh, in some ways. But I think in this, this discussion, I think it would be a major mistake to believe that our struggle with right-wing populism was over. And I think we're still at, in an in important struggle with, with, with right-wing populists, but also with neoliberals. And here's the thing. I think that Osh matters are very important in that struggle. Because we find ourselves in a war with two, on two fronts, in my opinion. On the one side, we have neoliberalism, where markets is always the solution. Trade unions are the problem. And rules and regulation, including OSH, is always an obstacle. And this is the paradigm where we have found ourselves for a long time with the Barroso Commission as the clear illustration of what neoliberalism, neoliberalism can be. And as you all know here, uh, nothing happened in the OSH area during this period. This is the, the, the neoliberal paradigm. But then on the other side, we find the right-wing populism. And here, the core is to put what they call the innocent and the pure people against the corrupt elites. And they want to make themselves the represents of what they call the true people. And trade unions are always the opponent because we compete in representing the working class and people who work. But then again, why do I raise this in an OSH conference? I think that OSH plays a key role in three areas where populists attack our democracies. And democracy has three weak spots and populists have identified all of these. And OSH can make a difference here in protecting democracy. Uh, and let me explain a little bit my thinking here. So, the first weakness is what we could call belonging. Who are part of a society? How do you demark who's part of the people? Well, democracy is vulnerable because the question has no final answer. Right-wing populists say, we will look after the true people. However, OSH do not accept such, such distinctions. In fact, many of the workers with our worst health and safety uh, conditions will be migrant or mobile workers. And migrant and mobile workers are at the forefront and our attention of these workers can never be relaxed. So I think this is an area where we can make a difference by, by bringing our attention to, to, to those that are most vulnerable and, 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 and sometimes populists try to exclude. The second weakness of democracy uh, deals with the vision of power. How, who has power in the democracy? And again, there is no final answer to this question. The answer lays in the interplay between politicians, lawyers, civil serv servants, experts, and many other groups. And populist, populist therefore says, I will clean or drain the swamp. Let's end all endless discussion. And in Osh, I think we should look out for the populists that might to want to drain the swamp, say there's too much experts, or neoliberals for that sake, who also wants to end the political debates. So let us therefore be clear in our different roles within the Osh community. So, so uh, this is important for me to say as, as a, a politician in a way that I'm not going to get into any expert role or replace any experts in, in this field. 
And I think this is also a time where I want to, to, to thank, uh, on a very personal note, all the people working at the E2UI, E2UI, because uh, they have such enormous knowledge and, uh, and are such uh, distinguished experts. So it's, it's been really an honor to, to work with, with, with the colleagues. But I, I do think that this is something that we have to always watch out for. The people that says that things need to be simpler, let us drain the swamp. The third weakness is, I call it speed and action, uh, but democracy can be very slow and results might take time. And again, uh, I don't think that neoliberals have been very useful in, in, in that way. Uh, And populists take advantage of these weakness and they say, vote for us and there will be real change. And I think for us, it also means that the rules that we are part of establishing, they must make a real difference. But it also means that we have to make the necessary compromises and make things happen. Uh, and I think the next couple of years are going to be very important for us. Many proposals are in the OSH line, as you know. We're about to finish uh, CMD4. Hopefully we'll soon have CMD5 uh, in the legacy process as well. We might soon have a proposal on, on cutting down asbestos. We have a new framework program and hopefully also a proposal on a directive for psychosocial risk. And I know that many of the issues I mentioned here are, are, are on the agenda here, but this is just a few to, to mention a few things ahead of us. And here I had also planned to say something about how COVID-19, uh, the pandemic no longer is a public health issue only, but very much an occupational health issue. And, and um, I think that the dimension of occupational health and safety OSH, is a fundamental part of the European strategy for limiting the spread of the virus and for maintaining economic activities. But I realize that, that there is not a lot of time here and I do have to finish soon. Uh, but I think what we have to, what, what, what I would like to, to, to bring from a political level to, to the discussion here is to, to, to also think of this as a time of opportunity because we're also leaving the neoliberal paradigm behind us. And I think that what we do as trade unions and within the OSH community is increasingly a part of the solution. And I think that's what, what the, our American friends at AFL-CIO have realized that they have to make a difference but they have a short time span. And I don't think we should overestimate the time span that we have either, because things might change very fast. And I want to remind you of this simple fact that what we do together in the OSH community matters, not only in a narrow sense of occupational health and safety, but also in the political struggles where we find our societies today. And I wish you all the best for this conference. And uh, I hope to take part as much as possible, even though uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to run between different things. But again, thank you very much for inviting me. And sorry for being a bit long. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus Nikola, for the opening words. And now to um, Marianne Skarpan, ETU, our Head of Unit for Occupational uh, Health and Safety and Working Conditions, for her opening remarks. Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paula. And, uh, and thank you, uh, Klaus Michael, for your inspiring uh, contribution to this um, uh, conference, putting OSH in a broader perspective and um, also seeing this time and age as, uh, as an opportunity uh, for us to, uh, uh, to, to find more results uh, of our work. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it, it was really inspiring. Now, um, dear participants of this conference, welcome to all of you. Also from my side, on behalf of the uh, OSH Research Unit of the EQI, 
And um, the theme of this conference is lessons learned from the pandemic. Not very original. But if there's one field, I think, uh, that uh, should uh, shed light on lessons learned from the pandemic, I think it's OSH. Now, I will get, come back to that later, but first I want to make a personal note. This conference, once more, is online. Well, it's hybrid, but there, are only, there will only be a couple of uh, people present here in this uh, studio. Uh, at this moment, on my uh, side, it is uh, Oud Cevalierio, my colleague from the unit. Oud, you must say something so people can see you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm very happy to have her here. And over the days to come, or over today and tomorrow, there will be other people present here uh, uh, at the table. So uh, uh, that is really great. But most of you, I don't see. If there's one lesson that I have learned from the pandemic personally, it is that the main thing that matters to me is human contact and communication. And I mean contact with humans, real humans, like touchable humans, real life communication. And without seeing you all in real life here in Brussels, our communication is far from optimal. I can't even see you on screen. So of course we have the best tools available. Um, you know, you can use the Q and A, Paula is there uh, to collect your questions. She will provide me with them, et cetera, et cetera. It'll all fine, but it would be so much better if you would be here. So therefore, I took the effort of trying to get acquainted with you in another way, by a close look at the participants list of this conference. Who are you? Let me just go into that before I will go into the content details of the conference. We have 187 registered participants from, six, from 38 countries, from six continents. The only continent that is not represented here is Antarctica. I don't know if that country, that continent has any inhabitants at all. So um, we are many. Um, at the moment, 73 of you have, uh, have uh, come online. So thank you for that. And I'm sure that uh, during the days, uh, more people will come and, uh, and will choose their, uh, their part of the conference. Another remarkable feature of uh, the participant list is, where are you from? Of course, we have many trade unionists present today, both from national and EU level, but also, and I listed, academics, representatives of NGOs, EU political in institutions, national ministries, EU works councils, employers' organizations, industry, medical insurance companies, the ILO, EU OSHA, the Labour Inspectorate. And I probably have overlooked a few because I cannot interpret all the abbreviations that, um, uh, that are on the participants list. So welcome to all of you. And now I hope by having gone into a bit of detail of your presence, who is present here today, you may, I hope that you will feel a bit more connected today and tomorrow, and also amongst one another. So now, um, there is also another reason for me to highlight your credentials into this much detail, because it's really simple. It shows how broad the interest in OSH is today. And there, I connect to Klaus Michael's speech as well. I mean, it's clear that uh, uh, the interest for OSH has broadened. And this, I think, definitely has something to do with our experiences during the pandemic. And that is exactly my key message in, uh, for this introduction. The COVID pandemic seems to have been a wake-up call for the importance of safe and healthy working conditions. While in normal times, people that fall ill from their work, like they, they, they have cancer or respiratory diseases or a, a depression or whatever, normally it was just the victim to suffer. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought this into broad daylight. Um, personnel in the healthcare sector falling ill from COVID-19 um, 
uh, threatened the continuation of this very essential service. Meat processing workers falling ill from, uh, from COVID-19, they all of a sudden, it, they were not um, in, in the dark anymore. They were out there because they formed a threat for all of us. And, um, and um, the telework shift that we faced confronted a large part of the population all of a sudden with psychosocial risks, the psychosocial risks of telework, isolation, communication, management problems, those kind of things. In other words, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown a spotlight on occupational health risks and worked as it were as a magnifying mirror. And um, by doing so, it brought the attention uh, uh, on the topic of a much broader audience than just OSH specialists. It seems that all of a sudden, OSH became hot and that provides us with a window of opportunity for action. Now the conference, just shortly, while organizing this conference, we made the very simple decision, uh, the division between the professions that were teleworkable and the, on the other hand, on what has become known as essential sec uh, sectors or essential profes professions. It's a very simple division. It's a very obvious division also that, that, that became clear in uh, during this pandemic. And uh, so we have two panels, one on the telework, one on the uh, uh, essential sectors. The essential sectors will be tomorrow morning and we will have a sectoral approach. We will hear the trade union voice of the education sector, the, uh, agricultural sector and the public transport sector. The um, uh, teleworkal, teleworkable professions that telework and the psychosocial risks will be uh, the topic of today, uh, the second session. And there we don't use a sectoral approach because telework is everywhere and it, it faces similar problems. So we will more have like um, uh, a conceptual, analytical and legal approach. What actually are psychosocial risks? How do we define them? Um, what, uh, what are the gender uh, uh, impacts of psychosocial risks? And how, um, uh, how can psychosocial risks be regulated? Because they hardly are. Uh, Klaus Michael mentions the possibility of a psychosocial risk directive. It is really strange that this has not occurred yet in, uh, in Europe because those psychosocial risks are far from new. They have long been labeled as uh, emerging risks, but they are not. They are there already for decades. So um, there uh, is a lot of work to do. Now, second panel, psychosocial risk, the third, uh, the, the sectors. The fourth panel, we go to the shop floor level. We will illustrate, uh, we will to, so we go to the workplace, to the experiences of real workers. And uh, during the pandemic, to that aim, we will shortly introduce our um, magazine, uh, the latest issue of our Hezamak magazine. This is a magazine on occupational health and safety, but not, from an academic angle or a technical angle, but very much from a, a bottom-up angle, telling the stories of workers and learning from them. Um, and then we will have an, uh, an interview on one of the uh, uh, one of the articles in this uh, in this uh, uh, magazine. So. I mentioned our first panel last because uh, that is the one that will start in a few minutes. It has a more overarching theme. And um, let's say at the structural and institutional level, it's about um, the uh, connection the, between occupational safety and health and public health. I will go into much uh, more detail when I start that session. But first I want to wish you a fruitful conference. I hope that uh, the speakers will bring you new insights or confirm your own, broaden them, deepen them. I also hope that despite the limited possibilities we have for exchange, that you will use those possibilities to the full. Please don't hesitate to write your questions in Q&A. 
or come back to us later if certain stories and insights of the conference work as a hook for you to tell your own. And um, uh, for I think exchange is uh, is let's say the it's the birthplace of learning. So welcome and enjoy the exchange. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to change role, which is a bit. Um, All very much inside. And uh, we are, we have an excellent timing. We will now start our first content session. And as I just explained, we will start with an overarching team at a structural and institutional level. Following the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, a particular notion suddenly started popping up in EU policy documents and debates, as well as on conference and research programs in the field, namely that of the important and often characterized as evident link between occupational safety and health and public health. The concept arises particularly in relation to the goal of increased preparedness for potential future health crisis. And um, this is outlined also in the EU OSH strategic framework, the new one from 21 to 27. And in this context, the European Commission advocates synergies, synergies between OSH and public health should be further developed. However, Nowhere in the policy documents is this apparently evident link being explained, nor is there any clarity offered about how such synergies should be promoted. And remarkably so, nor does the academic literature on the topic provide us with much content on the interlinkage. So it is therefore not surprising that at international and EU conferences, the topic appears in the form of exploration. And that is exactly what we also aim to do with this session. The first explore exploration of the interlinkage between OSH and public health and ways to improve synergies between the two fields. In order to do so, we invited three speakers. One public health specialist, Professor Scott Breer, an OSH specialist uh, and occupational medicine consultant, Peter Noon, and the spokesperson of the employers, uh, the European Employers Organization Business Europe, Christian Meester. Now, originally we planned to have a round table uh, which will never happen when we are online, but uh, anyway, that's uh, uh, a sidestep. Um, we plan to have a round table on this topic to have exchange, but while preparing, we soon found out that the topic is so new and so unexplored that we needed some um, introductory notes from the speakers in order to be able to discuss what we, are, what we want to discuss. So therefore we chose to give them the opportunity and they kindly agreed to have an introductory uh, 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 presentation first. So it is now time to introduce to you the first speaker and that is Scott Greer. And Scott is professor, professor of health management and policy, global public health and political science at the University of Michigan, United States. He is also a senior expert advisor on co governance at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. And Scott will shed light on the issue of today from a public health perspective. Uh, Scott, you are on the screen and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And I hope that this is useful. I'll do this sh screen share. Okay, again, thank you for coming. I'm very, very glad that you're hosting this event because 
one of the interesting things about public health and OSH is precisely a vague public health sense that OSH belongs to us, combined with obvious differences in the way that OSH works, it's regulated, and its legal framework operates. So I'm very happy to have the opportunity to try and help bridge these gaps. What is public health? Often misrepresented is probably what I should have said first. But public health has a number of kind of key attributes when we say public health approach. It's collective. It thinks in terms of the broad collective of people. It's not individual medicine. It's public. Above all, we think about the use of public power. We think of the use of the government, occasionally others like social partners, but basically it's about public authorities activity. It's probabilistic. We think in probabilities. We're not saying that this pattern of behavior is going to lead to this outcome. We're not saying that this risk guarantees cancer. We're saying that there's a probability and that we need to think in terms of reducing the probabilities of ill health and bad consequences. It is therefore also preventative. We don't know what's going to happen, but we are doing our best to identify avoidable problems Morning that we can in prevent. Progress. We can all, it's also fundamentally regulatory. Public health agencies provide a lot of services one way or another around Europe and the world. But above all, the effective policy instruments of public health are regulation. Regulation on everything from employment to how to maintain a business through to personal hygiene. That sits in tension with the fact that it's also occasionally empowering. Public health, like many professions, has developed a strong sensibility in recent years, recent decades, that it should be about working with communities and empowering them. And as you might imagine, there's always a tension, which is being seen, for example, around the world in vaccine and vaccination programs between empowering people and working with communities and using regulatory public power to get things done. So that's the public health mindset. When you talk about a public health approach, you're talking about understanding probabilities of risks and using public power to address collective problems in a preventative way. The basic method that this reduces to is three steps. Sounds simple, each step is hard. The first step is to identify a cause of avoidable morbidity and mortality, something that is making people sick, to find a pattern. So you notice a famously, for example, you notice a cancer cluster associated with an industrial facility, or you notice a pattern in the relationship between a food additive and some kind of ill health. So the first step is to find the avoidable mortality. The second is to find the cause. Is it an environmental hazard? Is it something to do with behavior? Is it a risk like traffic wrecks or something? And the third one is to identify the policy and the politics to address it. As you might imagine, this is difficult and interdisciplinary. How do you find a cluster of deaths that can be explained by something other than chance? How do you figure out what's causing them in a valid and reliable way? And then what do you do in terms of both coming up with an effective policy that can be implemented and that politicians will accept? Now, there's a lot said about public health as well, and so it's worth saying what it isn't. Well, first of all, it isn't internationally consistent. My joke is that when I go to international public health conferences and somebody tells me how public health works, there's always an unspoken footnote on what they say, which is it's how public health works in their opinion in their country. The amount of variation in terms of organization, in terms of powers, in terms of preoccupations, the training of the people, the resources, is enormously different from country to country. So we have a nice scientific international technical language that makes it sound like we're all the same, but we're really not. It also is not entirely population focused. We don't think about the whole population of Germany or France or Britain or Italy as one unit. We're very good at stratifying. We spend a lot of time thinking about specific populations and specific subpopulations. So we sometimes get caricatured as thinking about the whole population when actually what we're good at doing is thinking about sex workers or essential workers or particular migrant communities. That's the core of public health analysis as we do it. 
And the third is that while in theory we claim everything that causes avoidable mortality, everything that causes avoidable sickness and death, if you look at the history, there's a lot of fields that began as much more intimately linked to public health and have now moved out. Sanitary, civil engineering, and social work in many cases began in public health and became autonomous, coherent activities of their own with their own professional rules and norms. Now, one of the interesting relationships since the birth of both public health and OSH is between them. Now, there's a historical divide, even though in many ways, conceptually, they're the same business. But first of all, organizationally, public health is generally the work of public authorities. It's always lived within government, whereas occupational safety and health has been much more contested and it's been much more controlled by employers and unions, the social partners. And you see this not just on the ground, but also in the structure of the law and in the structure of ministries. Where is OSH located? Who is trained in OSH? What are the credentials and so forth? So they've been quite separate worlds. And that makes a lot of sense because OSH is in many ways fundamentally about control of the shop floor. It's about the business. It's about managerial discretion, workers protection. Businesses are obviously extremely interested in who controls their processes and their workforce, and so are unions. So you can see two different groups with a great deal of interest in OSH who don't have a lot of incentive to want to bring in a different public agency with a different set of broader preoccupations. And you also find that this manifests in intellectual differences in how people often think. Or if public health is the search for avoidable mortality and its causes, OSH tends to begin with the processes to think about what are the safety and health, especially safety implications of a given process, a given way of working. So it's much more focused on process and engineering than probabilities and populations. Now in the EU, as you would expect, they're very different. We begin with the fact that OSH is very old in EU law. The social policy treaty bases have been around practically since the foundation of the European Economic Community in the 50s. Public health is much weaker. Yeah, you only saw the public health article introduced in 1992 at Maastricht, and it is absolutely a glossary. It is a dictionary of all the words you use in EU law when you don't actually want to enable strong action. You see that in the internal organization of the EU. For example, at the commission, DG employment is much bigger and more powerful than Santé, which was originally a splinter taken away from DG employment 20 years ago. And likewise, if you look at just basic representational forms in Brussels, as well as the reality of interest representation, the social partners are much bigger and better organized. We have the obvious fact that about 80% of all the lobbies in Brussels are actually businesses. But then also the importance of the trades unions and the importance of social dialogue shows the status of those issues. The result is that public health, social policy, and OSH all mean different things in EU politics than they mean on the ground. The European Union's legal and conceptual framework doesn't look quite like any member state. But I want to underline the idea that there's some kind of a public health argument against holding employers responsible for measures against disease is nonsense. There is a full public health understanding that employers can become major sources of ill health and that they can affect the communities around them. So how do we bridge the gap? It occurred to me when I was speaking with Marianne and Paula in the preparation for this panel that in many ways the answer is right in front of us. It's the word health. Now, I usually hate it when people deliver presentations at health conferences about health and then at the end triumphantly announce that they've discovered health. But I assume you are too. But bear with me here. The opportunity is to think about the overlap in occupational health and safety, which often has a tendency, which you can see why it would happen, to focus a little bit more on safety than on health. And at the same time, to identify the areas in which there is a health consequence to OSH and vice versa that would interest public health. So I think there's two ways to think about this. One is intellectual and one is coalitional, political. Intellectually, what we want to do is to start doing the long, hard work of formulating public health and OSH data better so that we can understand the long-term effects of workplaces 
on their workers and on the populations around them. An obvious one is cancer registries that actually contain work history so that we can identify sources of workplace risk that haven't been properly understood. On the other side, think about all the knowledge in OSH about uh, processes and populations. This can be mutually reinforcing. What are the populations from which workers are drawn and what are the processes that affect the lives of those workers? So I think there's a lot of scope for sort of better epidemiology and exposure analysis registries and data for both sides. The way I would frame this is that we want to think about the place of work across the entire life course and in the population perspective. Work is one chapter in our lives. We come into it with whatever health status and wellness we got from our earlier lives and from our schools. We leave it in many cases into the hands of public authorities that will look after us in our older years. We need to think about work as part of that population perspective, as something that will have consequences later in life, as something that will affect our community. Now, who wants to do that is the question. Well, unions have a lot more incentive to find long-term avoidable mortality than employers, because the employers in many ways will be able to be rid of you, if you once you've left their business, whereas unions have more incentive to show their protection of the workers on being crude here. Unions also typically have more incentive to be interested in members' families and communities. What this might point to, and this is where I don't spend enough time in the OSH community to have a strong opinion, is more of a focus on health, more of a focus on long-term causes and community causes of disease related to work. Public health authorities have powerful intellectual tools and sometimes legal power to identify and act on unhealthy sectors and workplaces. So there's a lot of unused public health powers, I think, as we all learned in the case of abattoirs with COVID-19. There were a lot of things that public authorities could have done to understand and act on the situation in slaughterhouses in 2020 much more quickly. Third parties in civil society are real allies. Don't forget about patients organizations, rare disease organizations, parents organizations. There's a shared interest in and outside the plant in not having the plant produce an environmental risk. And there's a lot of opportunities. You don't need to start with the whole economy. Thinking about the structure of supply chains, where risks enter in those, labor conditions domestically and around the world, unsafe or toxic work environments, whether it's in new industries like the batteries for electric cars or old industries like butchery. So I think there's potentially some strong coalitions both between social partners and public health, but also with a broader relationship to civil society, the parents, the patients, the communities around us that would benefit. So that's my effort to start things on, to start off the panel. And what I really wanna underline is that there's far more opportunities to work together on health than there are divisions. And there's not a lot of intellectual case to say that public health undermines OSH. Thank you so much, uh, Scott, for this very, very, interesting uh, presentation. I think you told us, you, you really gave us a lot of uh, 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 information and, uh, and explanation in, in this uh, very few minutes. So, uh, so thanks a lot. I think it's a good basis to move on uh, uh, this discussion. Uh, so um, I will immediately go to the second speaker and that is uh, Mr. Peter Noon and he is a consultant in occupational medicine for the health service executive in Ireland. And Peter will shed light on the issue from an OSH perspective. Peter, you have a long-term experience in the field and uh, I'm looking forward to your presentation. You have the floor, thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much. And, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, I feel an element of imposter syndrome after the last speaker here. <laughs> um, so so the, the brief is to kind of look at it from an occupational health uh, point of view and, and to kind of share our experience and concerns. So um, I suppose occupational health has a background in, in the dark arts or the study of the dark arts. Um, this is obviously to do with mining and, and the various uh, toxic uh, 
consequences or toxic effects of exposure. This is Ramazzini's, um, you know, seminal work in 1700, um, the father of um, modern occupational medicine um, from uh, Medina in Italy and, and then in Padua. So, um, sorry. The, uh, I, So uh, th this is uh, from Professor Malcolm Harrington in, in Birmingham, and he, he charted the sort of seven ages of occupational medicine. And, and perhaps at the moment, you, you know, we haven't been fully included in, in, in the public health agenda and in the wider policy and, and um, you know, priority formulation. Um, we, we're in a state of existentialism, uh, but, but our brief is to kind of look at the effects of, of general health conditions on work and workability and um, participation in the labour market and, and then in terms of work-related diseases, diseases that can be aggravated by the work and but for the work would they be as severe or troublesome as they are and, and that includes you know chronic con degenerative conditions and then in terms of occupational diseases, conditions <clears throat> you know arising out of or in direct connection with the work or the workplace. Um, so uh, th there's what we generally focus on is, you know, things like uh, employee health surveillance, which usually is a statutory framework. Um, there, there can be some health promotion elements of that, but it, it's usually to do with the risks of work and health and health and work. Uh, and um, then the employer's response to, to, to um, absence management and, and uh, more recently we're getting involved in this. This is the NIOSH. Uh, workplace health concept, which um, I, the previous speaker touched on in terms of the more global, you know, wider dimensions of health. So, um, so I trained in Scotland and the NHS had this concept of staff governance and, and it seemed to be, um, it located really the employer's duty of care with regard to OSH in, in, in terms of its overall organizational governance framework um, and it gave uh, due attention to, to occupational health and safety issues in the workplace so under that people were uh, you know entitled to be well informed appropriately trained and involved in decisions that affected them and, and provided with the continuously improving safe and effective work environment and this was from the English um, NHS and it basically you know mirrors the health and safety regulatory framework that we operate within you know the employee's entitlement to a safe place of work safe environment safe systems of work and safe and effective colleagues mediated through the policies procedure, procedures and practices of the organization which has consequences both physically and mentally and psychologically for staff affects their performance and their behavior and their engagement with the organizational goals and it impacts on outcomes. So this can be patient care in, in, in a health se as setter, sector, but I mean, it can be, you know, organizational business continuity, sustainability in a, in a kind of commercial setting. And um, bringing that then together in terms of how we approach it, it's from a hierarchy of control from uh, an OSH perspective in terms of eliminating risks, uh, um, obviously carcinogens, it's important because any exposure over zero could potentially cause um, occupational cancers and and, the, and then looking at other options uh, if that's not possible in turn in including substitution of hazards or engineering controls administrative controls and finally PPE and uh, personal protective equipment and after that vaccination uh, as we'll see in relation to cosh and 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 we had a, a difficulty or we had an awareness early on that uh, you know the virus was airborne there was asymptomatic transmission that um, we needed to integrate these hierarchy of measures yet at a public health at a a microbiology level, there didn't seem to be awareness of this OSH paradigm, which, which caused um, difficulties for us on the ground. And we were deployed to track and trace um, when, when the virus had already become endemic, you know, with uh, test positivity rates more than 5%, where, you, you know, we needed to uh, stop these people getting infected in the first place um, and maintain levels of, of transmission to a low level where we could effectively track, trace and isolate. So 
this is the Swiss with cheese model. It comes from James Reason. Um, it's called the defense in depth in that multiple um, sequential measures of control ha have much more impact than one measure alone. And I suppose that feeds into, you know, where vaccination fits in, in, in the European strategy or in the individual country strategy or at a global level in that the vaccine is non-sterilizing immunity. It's arguably whether it ever will be with a mucosal respiratory viral infection and, you know, you will get waning of protection and there's variation in you know, the response to protection by the individual. And, and then there's aspects um, like uh, vaccine uh, or immune escape, um, which we're, we're concerned about at the moment uh, in, in relation to the mu variant or, or the, the Omicron variant. But uh, th this is shared responsibilities between individual responsibilities and, and the organizational ones and um, how that's uh, negotiated and, and tarified and, and um, implemented is uh, of, of uh, you know, great um, involvement of occupational health on the ground at the moment. Um, so this is just a, a two curves which shows that, you know, a vaccine just strategy um, w will not reduce the um, transmission, uh, you, you know, number of, of, of for Delta or for, for Omicron um, but below the, the level at which the, you know, um, pandemic will, will be uh, decaying. And, um, but if we integrate public health measures with, with vaccine, then, then we can have um, impact. And uh, the British Occupational Hygiene Society brought that together in a risk rating um, uh, in, in, in sort of, June, July, 2020, um, when we looked at the traditional OSH um, paradigm in relation to source controls, um, you know, isolating the, the, the virus, and, and then in terms of pathway ventilation, filtration, you know, administrative controls, uh, and then the, finally the, the protective equipment, which um, has problems in terms of fit, uh, compliance, um, tolerance, and, and I, I, I suppose even breakthrough. Um, and this was, you know, brought in a, a hazard rating. So you could look at what individuals did and you had examples of the occupational groups that were potentially uh, uh, thus affected. Uh, and it assigned an exposure ranking with a controlled banding. And you could look at the source, the pathway and the receptor controls applicable to that exposure ranking and controlled banding. Um, that was not necessarily accepted from a public health perspective. In fact, in my experience, uh, it was often rebuffed and, and uh, we felt disempowered and, and um, unheard um, and sometimes gaslighted. Uh, so, so as we can see, this is just a form about the relative effectiveness of protection um, in relation to vaccine efficacy and vaccine uptake. and. We have this issue about risk tolerance and, and who decides what's acceptable risk. Is that, you know, at a public health level, a population level? Is, is that at um, the individual with a particular vulnerability, you know, be they pregnant or they have a chronic uh, immunodeficient condition or they, you know, or have a certain ethnicity or, you know, uh, their, their weight, um, their age group, um, their gender, et cetera, socioeconomic factors. Or is this, um, you know, something that the employer has responsibility for, particularly within health and safety uh, regulations at a workplace? Um, a lot of my colleagues say that not just in Ireland, um, in the UK, perhaps Norway, um, more widely, that there was a perception that OSH um, regulations were set aside for the duration of the pandemic and that, you know, compliance with public health um, guidelines as it were, were were reflective of the employer discharging their duty of care are from our own regulator in ireland they, they had the view that this is an international pandemic and hence one couldn't isolate the workers from you know the general community transmission and even faced with evidence where it was available because i suppose funding for occupational health safety um, studies has been reduced um, in recent years there's been a reduction in academic centers certainly in in, in the uk and and 
um, we, we don't have a, we have a safety, um, I suppose, academic centres in Ireland, but we don't have a, a good occupational medical uh, academic centre. Um, th th there is this issue about, um, you know, who, who decides what risk is acceptable. But from our, as I say, from our regulator, th they felt that it, uh, it wasn't their uh, responsibility and that um, the, the studies that were there from international um, excess risk in certain occupations, um, there wasn't data for Ireland, so therefore that didn't matter. Although there was data for healthcare workers, but that really was the... Um, only clear data available for, for our jurisdiction. So um, I suppose health risk assessment and control, um, we've heard about, uh, you know, particular hazards like asbestos, and, and this was from Professor M. Dagius, uh, this, he's emeritus from the Centre of Occupational Environmental Medicine in Edinburgh, or in, in, in Manchester. Um, this was in the Brompton Hospital in London in 1980, and this was the approach to health risk management. It was in the basement where there was asbestos, and, and the advice was not to inhale. Um, you know, in our, in our experience with the, uh, you know, denial that it was airborne spread and that um, it, it uh, surgical masks uh, were effective when we knew that there was 50% leakage on exhalation and inhalation. You, you know, we we felt that we were chasing our tails in terms of, um, you know, tr trying to deal with the, the the occupational, you know, the operational delivery aspects of, of um, our, our service, um, whilst the, you know, primary risk management wasn't, um, at source wasn't being delivered. So um, just moving on, I suppose from an OSH perspective, our, our view was, Sorry, this is the Broad Street Pump, which is the kind of famous uh, seminal work by John Snow in, in the 1880s or so about uh, the cholera epidemics in London and, and um, where, where they were drawing, you know, contaminated water from the Thames and he took the handle off the pump and it sort of started the sanitary reforms for clean water that... Um, you, you know, we're at a, a stage now that we should be talking about a safe work environment, and, and that needs to be driven by precautionary principles that, you know, reasonable steps to reduce the risk shouldn't await for scientific certainty, although we do believe there is scientific certainty about airborne spread now and the need for, you know, airborne controls, not just masks, but ventilation, filtration and safer design of, of, of buildings. Um, but... Uh, Presently, I think the, we, we believe we should have a relationship with occupational or with public health, but we don't necessarily feel we're equal partners. We, we see that we're outside the policy formulation, that, that there's a blind spot about OSH um, and that we should be involved, but we perceive there's a need to maintain our independence and also perhaps the paradigm element of it that you know we, we see it from a health risk management control at an individual within a workplace and that needs to be ideally the risk needs to be eliminated if it can't be one relies on the perhaps low less robust um, uh, you, you know state of controlling that risk as far as is reasonably practicable but at the moment we see that public health and and infection prevention and control and OSH are perhaps looking at different parts of the world from, from their own telescopes. So um, thank you for your attention and um, hopefully that was uh, of some use. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. That was definitely of some use, uh, uh, which is an understatement. It's uh, thank you for bringing in also uh, the historical perspective, but also a, a, I think uh, you have um, uh, put many critical notes at the table that, uh, that uh, we need to address uh, and uh, we won't be able to do all of them uh, today, but uh, I think uh, you, you certainly gave it um, uh, the discussion, uh, many elements uh, to, to function as a starting point. So thank you, thank you really. Um, then we have our next speaker, and I won't wait any longer because Chris de Meester, he has to leave us uh, in half an hour, but uh, he has uh, enough time uh, to present his views, and I hope maybe to, uh, to be part of the discussion for, for a while. 
Um, so our next speaker is um, Mr. Chris De Meester. He is um, many things, but um, in, he is now in his uh, um, uh, condition of the spokesperson of the uh, European Employers Organization, Business Europe. Chris, hartelijk welkom. You have the floor. We don't hear you. Please, we yeah. don't. Can yeah. you hear ah. me now? Yeah. And you see my presentation? That was my question. Yes, we see your presentation. Okay. So, yeah, thank you. Um, for First of all, thank you for inviting me here. I will be speaking on my own personal behalf, but uh, I will use my experiences gained from being the spokesperson for the European employers and also the, the chair of the Business Europe Working Group on Safety and Health. So what I'm going to say, and I will try to be brief, I have 10 points, short points, lessons that I draw from the COVID pandemic that I would like to share with you. And as I said, they are not necessarily the employer's views, but uh, I tried to capture as much as elements as possible to come to those 10 points. The first point that I would uh, like to make is that simple fact for me is that occupational safety and health from the occupational safety and health point of view we have the better procedures and tools for dealing with hazards and that is of course compared to public health uh, the prevention principles that we use the approaches that we use uh, the risk assessment etc they are all long-standing long-standing procedures methodologies and tools um, of which the fundamentals go back almost to the end of the 18th century with the introduction of uh, machines, uh, steam, etc. And we have also not just the tools to determine what kind of measures work best, but also we have the mechanisms to make them, to bring them to life um, in a working environment. Um, risk assessment, as I said, um, the process, we all know that. That is something that uh, I see people in public health still struggling with. Um, and this is an example I would like to share with you. This was drawn from the occupational safety and health point of view. Um, this is the COVID guidance publication uh, for companies in Belgium, both private and public sector, with basically all the very practical measures uh, and approaches that you should take at company level to avoid as much as possible that people get infected or that the virus spreads uh, in a work environment. And that was built upon all those practices and experience that I just mentioned. Um, but this is also a simple fact that goes for my country, but uh, if I uh, get information from my colleagues also is a valid point for a lot of other countries. Although we have the better tools and approaches and more experience in prevention, my conclusion is that the OSH people or the ministries responsible are not leading the debates or, or are even absent from COVID decision making. Um, we are part of it, but certainly not uh, in the driver's seat. Point two, and that is linked to the previous point. Not only do we have the better tools, as I said, we also have the mechanisms to create a broad support base at company level. Uh, this is the picture for Belgium, but I guess you recognize it. Um, it's the, the dedicated persons for OSH. So the OSH experts uh, inside and outside the company, the workers consultation of workers, clear role for the hierarchical line, the management and company's responsibility with the employer. So this is the mechanism to make sure that you have a support base for your measures. Contrary to a political decision, where often a small group of people makes a decision and then you have to live up to it, there is room for discussion, consultation, expert input at company level. My third point, and that is, um, it's not OSH versus public health, it should be, of course, the both together, an integrated approach. 
And this is the picture that we use. It looks a bit complex, but basically what you have to do at the workplace is from your traditional risk assessment approach, you combine this now with a situation analysis because some of the measures we have to take, they do not stem from risk assessment. They are imposed like the distancing rules, hygiene, isolate people when you're infected or show symptoms of illness, etc. So that's situation assessment and risk assessment fit to do the to together try to um, fit everything together and the tools we use we use for that are the tools that we know it's the use of experts it's information and training it's consultation and it's the organization of the measures so for me this is key or should be key to any approach public health layer and occupational safety and health approach fit the two together at company level um, but Having said that, um, what I also, a uh, conclusion I draw is that our government people or the decision makers, they talk a lot about measures, but actually they mean principles. Uh, they talk about measures like um, stay at a distance, keep distance, um, like uh, testing and tracing, but those are principles. They have never translated them to real measures. Unlike we did at company level, where, as I said, the two layers fit together, where the principle of keep a distance is translated into putting screens, clear marking barriers, uh, reducing teams uh, size, uh, shifting working hours, etc. So our politicians talk about measures, but actually they mean principles and they have failed to translate the principles into tangible me measures in the public uh, environment. So here's some examples. You all know that how it's organized at company level. Um, this is an example of uh, organization of teams. Don't mix the teams, reduce the size or shifting uh, presence at the workplace. Lesson number five, uh, translate the principles, what I just explained to tangible measures. Just one example and interesting example thing is this is an example an idea that came from a worker this is about organization of the dressing rooms how to know if there is a uh, still free space or not uh, or that not too many people are present at the same time simply this is um, the number of people that is allowed to be present at the same time if a batch is there you know one person is already there simple tangible but it's translation of a principle into a tangible measure. Another example of an organization of a workplace with circulation, with extra sanitation devices, with a reorganization of the workplace, etc. Lesson number uh, five, uh, communication is key. I think this goes uh, for itself, but the reality is that I take Belgium, but I've recently been to a couple of other countries for work the same situation there. There is hardly any, any available source that is 100% reliable on the measures. In Belgium, social partners at a certain point in time, we had listed no less than 100 errors or mistakes in the government consultation on the COVID measures, 100. At this point in time, communication is still failing it's hardly impossible to find the exact measures, what you have to do um, at workplace level if a certain situation occurs. Uh, the websites contain, the official website contains all date, outdated procedures uh, or the Corona app that we use uh, still has outdated procedures. Another example here is on vaccination. Um, the battle is lost, um, I guess, because there is so much fake information now. And it's, it's a pity because it's not just the anti-vaxxers. Um, just a very practical example, the biggest company in Belgium, which is a communication uh, company, Proximus, 40,000 employees, they did a social survey by their social services. Sure, you have the anti-vaxxers, but they are a small percentage of the non-vaccinated people, the majority of them were not vaccinated because of insufficient information, lacking the proper information to make a decision. So it's not all anti-vax, it's just not good communication 
not good information available to target specific groups of people. And I always said from the start of the COVID crisis, there is a lot of things that we cannot control, like how the virus mutates, how it transmits, etc. But at least try to be solid on the things that you can control, like your communication. Six, population is not the same as people. The approaches taken by public health in most cases or by the small group of virolog experts that uh, give advice to decision makers, they have a population approach. Whilst we, in the field of occupational safety and health, we also look at the individual, protect the individual. This has never been clearly communicated to the people. So what are your concerns as a citizen or as a worker? You're concerned about your safety, the safety of your parents, your kids, your friends. But the approach taken by the experts and most governments is a population approach, but they have never clearly explained it. Or they started to mix things up by saying, once you're vaccinated, the reign, the reign of freedom will come back for you as an individual, which is absolutely not true, as we can all witness now. Well, the talk, practice what you preach. There's an evident one. Everybody in OSH knows that um, you can have the best uh, health and safety management system, but if you do not walk the talk, practice what you preach, your workers will not follow. Same here, every day, Everywhere in Europe, we see decision makers, politicians, and even experts. We see them appearing in TV shows, uh, not respecting the rules that we have to live up uh, to at the workplace level. We see ministers traveling, not for work, but for um, to assist at some fancy event somewhere in the United States, while there is still strongly uh, disadvised to travel, et cetera, et cetera. Every day, we saw examples of politicians, decision makers, not practicing what you preach. And I'm not going to hide it. We also saw company managers not practicing uh, what they preach, but the same thing goes for individuals, even individual workers. But you get the idea. It's difficult to pass the message. And yeah, practice what you preach, the beer that is there, because that is one of my hobbies. Uh, and I think, think this was a funny one, a beer from the Netherlands, practice what you preach in col collaboration with the Scottish brewery. Okay, almost there. The mandatory approach, the top-down approach does not work well. With mandatory, I mean um, decision makers saying, you're not allowed to do this, this is forbidden. That doesn't work well uh, because you do not get the rationale behind it's not often also not evidence-based. And again, it's a population approach. It's not translated to the level of individuals. So I don't think this works uh, very well. And I've always said, in my view, any activity should be possible if it meets certain conditions. And it should be the conditions that make something not possible instead of the decision by a politician. So for me, a nightclub, can be open, but there are limitations. And the limitations is the number of people that you could allow in the room, uh, the dimensions of the room, the ventilation. And if the conclusion of the owner is with those conditions, I cannot open, then the effect is the same. But now it's imposed. Um, you cannot open. So even if you have the biggest environment, the best ventilation system, you're still closed. That doesn't work because you lose credibility you lose support. Nine, role of labor inspection. Again, I think labor inspection should have primarily continued to focus on dealing with occupational safety and health risks and not so much with COVID. Now we had inspectors uh, that were um, forced to inspect on numbers of teleworkers, et cetera which as such is fine, but there are other means to control that. And at the same time, they were not uh, available anymore to uh, deal with the dangers and the hazards at the workplace that continue to be present because COVID didn't suddenly make chemical substances disappear, et cetera. Lesson number nine, the participative approach, wisdom of the crowds. Instead of a small group 
of often monodisciplinary experts, we should have used the wisdom, the knowledge and the creativity of all people willing to engage and come up with practical proposals. Wisdom of the crowds in Belgium and I know in other countries, we have a network of thousands of university degree occupational safety and health specialists. Why are they not part of the advisory systems in the COVID crisis? They have experience of prevention. None of the virologues around the table have any practical expertise on prevention. So wisdom of the crowds, use the creativity of the individual to come with very practical solutions. We have many examples of uh, quite ingenious approaches to dealing with uh, keeping distance, uh, hygiene, ventilation, etc. And that brings me to lesson number two, uh, trust and respect are the drivers in difficult times, but here in order to get the trust and the respect, of course, you have to make sure your communication is okay. Your measures are uh, supported by a broad support base. You have a multidisciplinary approach. Basically all the nine points before this, you need them. If not, number 10 will never happen. Uh, and we are losing grip. And this is my last one. Um, let's not forget that we need a support function for individuals who not have only have questions, but are often concerned, even afraid. We should have both at workplace level and in the public domain, a support function to listen to anybody who has concerns, questions, or is afraid during this COVID crisis pandemic. That was it. Number 11, your move. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, what, uh, uh, what makes me so happy is to, find, to, to see confirmed that uh, our field of uh, work and expertise is so practical and so concrete. Um, we always uh, look for um, a means of action. You know, we can, uh, we can theorize a lot, but uh, uh, OSH people then usually at the end of the day, they ask, yeah, oh, all right. Fine, but now what? What are we going to do? And this is something that I, I see in your uh, approach, uh, uh, Chris, and uh, I see many elements that I, uh, I couldn't agree more uh, to. And I also really like uh, the, the practical examples that you take uh, in, in, your, uh, in your presentation. And to look at the whole, I think we now have a, a broad uh, landscape, a broad uh, uh, overview and now we are in the challenge of um, of discussing um, and debating something of the things uh, that you the three speakers brought up I don't think that's very easy I had some very easy questions but um, I don't think they are easy at all um, what I see is that um, uh, Scott brought up a clear um, causal link between occupational health and safety and the public health uh, uh, in simple words, um, workers and citizens are the same people. So if workers are not healthy, then this shows in the public health statistics. Um, and um, uh, so better OSH is better public health. I mean, that's, uh, uh, so it's, it's one of the elements besides, uh, uh, besides individual behavior, uh, uh, diet uh, problems, uh, smoking, it needs to be taken into account of the causal uh, link. Um, but then I see the presentation of Peter. I, I mean, and I think Scott, you, you, um, your presentation breathed uh, some sort of optimism. It's shouting us in the face, health. We are all concerned with health. I mean, that's, that's something, um, um, it's obvious. Um, but then I hear Peter, and Peter, you speak from your um, experience during the pandemic, and um, um, you, you tell us um, hierarchy of control, risk rating. Um, it's, it's um, you know, the, 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 practice, the practices in the, in the pandemic have shown that occupational health and safety has been sidelined and, and, and be made... made um, uh, um, to well less worth less value than uh, than uh, public health measures and um, 
who decide what is an acceptable risk. Um, if you look at population level, it's something else than if you look at each and every individual worker. So that's another element. And um, there was one thing I thought I might come to a question. Uh, Yeah, well, it's it's basically this uh, this element of uh, putting aside um, uh, Porsche uh, as a as a means as a you know yeah you also spoke about we are not equal partners I think that's also a really important element because we see in Chris's uh, presentation we see fantastic uh, you know possibilities to uh, you know very practical very concrete why don't we apply it why don't we take it on board uh, uh, you know why haven't we during the pandemic so you are not equal partners so um, my question my prepared question was what synergies do you see and what can we do to improve the synergies? At what levels, what institutions, who needs to do what? It's quite a broad question. And it's, I think if you answer that question, we should take on board um, the concerns and, uh, that are based on experiences of that Peter uh, Noon uh, explained to us. It's, uh, it's possible to think of synergies, but, um, and we can think of actions, but are, Porsche and public health equal partners, how to deal with that? It's quite an issue. Um, maybe I can give the floor. Mm, Chris needs to leave in nine minutes. So I give the, that gives you a privilege, Chris, just a few reflections on that. Oh, my screen just blocked. <laughs> we hear you, so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just I found the screen again. Well, well, as I, I as I said, try to do control the things you can control. Right? And there I think a partnership is indeed necessary. I mean, you are dealing with a, a virus, so you need you need people from public health to come with information on on that virus, uh, but also for vaccination. But at the same time you need to take action to stop, to try to stop the virus from spreading. And there, the people from public health, they should acknowledge that their main field of expertise is not, not prevention. Um, they have no clue on how to translate those principles like physical distancing, hygiene, ventilation, how to bring that to practice in a work environment, but not just in a work environment, also in the public domain and there we should have and this is still my main message we need to find this partnership because we need the expertise from both sides to try to to capture all the elements and come to a as comprehensive as possible approach there will be always be factors that we cannot control and like the mutations etc but the underlying approach to how to as good as possible prevent the virus from spreading there we can take joint action and that goes beyond the workspace because as i said in the public domain i see everybody talking about measures but actually they are not talking about measures they're simply talking about the principle and i see no visible proof of any measure so we, we have we still have in belgium and i think in other parts of europe we still have mass events and they say, yeah, yeah, but you, you have to apply a physical distancing. Yeah, but I, there is no, there is no uh, entrance control. There is no, no counting. There is no crowd control. There are no barriers. There is no system, no procedure to make that principle into, to turn it into practical measures. And that is where they can learn from people at workplaces where I think in most workplaces, we did our utmost best to make it feasible, to make it tangible measures. Another example is public transport, which we know now is a major source of concern. And in the beginning, it was said, okay, you can only have that number of people on the bus, fine. But how do you organize that? Why is there not a reservation system for any means of public transport? I know there are countries where whatever means of transport you use, there is a reservation system, even for a bus or a tram, 
there is a dedicated seat, then you have a control measure. Maybe in some cities with um, a lot of people living there, it's not feasible, but in a lot of places it is feasible, but that did not happen. So there is the challenge for me for the future. And as I said, do not trust just a couple of experts. Um, we have occupational safety and has, uh, health prevention officers, dedicated experts in all countries use all of their wisdom, use the whole network. Um, maybe you will find an anti-vaxxer in that group too, but there is mechanisms for self-regulating to keep to kick those people out. But use the wisdom of thousand people instead of a small group of people uh, that do not cover the whole domain. Because as I said, uh, one of most of the virologists I see around the table in whatever European country, they lack the practice of prevention on the work floor in the public domain. So that is my main message. Um, open your eyes, talk together, work together. Um, and the decision making, okay, there will always in the end be a political decision making. But if we feed them with the expertise from the two domains and supported by a broad, large support base, even ideas from individual workers, then the end result will be so much better. That is my main message. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And you uh, very much uh, confirm once more uh, uh, the practical and concrete uh, approach of uh, OSH people. It's, uh, I find it really interesting um, what you say. Um, you, um, and I saw uh, the big eyes of Scott when you said public health is not about prevention, because uh, uh, if I recall, that was one of the main messages of Scott that uh, public health is all about prevention. So how is this? So there is a language issue. Uh, there is uh, so I think that uh, what uh, what Chris also said is, um, you know, to yeah. to have the aim of prevention yeah. is one thing, but to uh, Marianne on on that, uh, as social partners, we are part of the budget control of public health. Uh, the amount that okay, that's just a budget approach. What goes to prevention? Three percent. Mm -hmm. So don't tell me that it's all about prevention. It's not. Thank you, Chris, for this uh, for this extra remark. I uh, I will give uh, Scott the opportunity, you know, at large to react to that. Uh, but uh, I also see in your uh, um, in your um, uh, contribution, Chris, the, the the really concrete and practical approach. The, the, uh, it's something that I um, that I also struggle with. It's the um, translation of prevention principles into real measures at shop floor level. So, uh, and, 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 that is, and that is that is all OSH. And then Peter says, yeah, fair enough. But even when we struggle for that, um, uh, we are being sidelined. Uh, even though you, Peter, have, um, have based yourself on um, many, many um, instances of evidence, uh, of clear scientific evidence. So now I would really like to go first to Scott. What are we talking about? We speak about how to improve synergies, but Scott, maybe you can also react of this, on this element of prevention in public health and how to connect it to OSH. I think we just played out exactly what I was speaking about when I said that public health sounds like it's one thing conceptually and the actual implementations in different countries are extremely divergent. So my immediate answer is I have no idea what the prevention budget line means in a Belgian context. What I will say is that a lot of the time prevention is taken to mean preventative medicine. And often preventative medicine is a bad use of your budget because it, there's a lot of things that just don't work in preventative medicine. You know, for example, weight loss counseling, right? 99% of diets fail. So don't go spending a lot of money on giving diet advice. Um, so I think that's exactly the problem, right? Is that we say, what is public health? Is public health preventative? Conceptually, it's preventative because if we remove pollution from the air, then you're less likely to get a disease. But does it actually manifest as organizations engaged in work that is categorized in a given place as prevention? Much less likely. And what I would say is really, I think, important, and it underlies a lot of this issue, is the principles versus measures distinction, right? Because I'm sitting in a school of public health. I have no idea how to slaughter a thousand animals an hour. I have no idea how to organize a fast food restaurant. I have no idea how to run an auto plant. So one of the recurrent gaps and the need for some kind of partnership 
is simply that there's a lot of process expertise that you're not trained in because we're busy learning about epidemiology and community spread dynamics. And that's a subset of the broader problem that the scientists have done a wonderful job in this pandemic, but the matching that with behavioral and policy measures has been um, less successful. I have other things to say, but I, I think Chris has one minute. <laughs> Just a, a goodbye word from Chris, because Chris, you will leave now, I think. So yeah, we will discuss at the international level uh, technical guidance, guidance for labor inspection, including an important part on occupational safety and health in COVID. So I'll do my best. And it's with our, our colleague Wim van Velen, who is the spokesperson for the workers. So looking Great. forward. Thank you, Chris. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so so you wanted to say something more on this, uh, Scott? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so can I just give kind of a broader answer? And I'm, this is all me trying to avoid answering Daria's like intervention, which is really good, but I don't know what to say. Um, I think the key thing in the whole history, as I understand it, of OSH is that part of it is regulatory and the state makes you do it because of a political decision. But what employers really care about is continu continuity of business process. If you have an accident and you shut the line at an automobile final assembly plant for 10 minutes, that's an insane amount of money. That's millions of euros right there. It, the, the numbers are astonishing. So they're really, really interested in process. And on one hand, that means that they have an interest in not having people get sucked into machinery because that stops the line. For some employees, they want to keep the employees happy because they're so important, right? Now, if, you, if you're an employer who has basically low value employees, that, that it means they can be easily replaced, then you probably don't care too much about their safety. On the other hand, let's say you're in chemicals, you have an enormous amount of capital equipment, an enormous amount of money in those plants, and a very small workforce. So you can afford to treat the employees very well and keep them healthy because they have obscure skills and the labor budget, part of your budget is tiny compared to your equipment. But if you care about process, therefore, if I'm a chemical employer, I really want to make sure my plants are safe and don't explode and I get to keep my highly trained employees. I'm much less interested in finding out whether my plant is killing people in the surrounding community or giving the employees cancer that we won't see until they're 70. That's not to do with business process, so I'm not interested. So I think if we think through you can easily see where the weak spots are in terms of employers based on how closely connected is the business process to the safety and health issues. So in a slaughterhouse, nobody wants to work in a slaughterhouse. So to the extent, you know, so typically they've been highly replaceable workers, but if you let a slaughterhouse become a focus of infection, eventually you might interfere with its business process. And on the other hand, say in chemicals, you would put a, expect them to put a lot of effort into making sure that a chemical workplace is safe, even if you would also expect them to work very hard to avoid having anybody find out what the effects of those chemicals are on the workers in the surrounding communities over time. So I think if you focus on business process, that explains why there's a lot more emphasis on safety than on health and why individual businesses behave in very different ways. Thank you, thank you, Scott. Um, yeah, so this touched upon uh, yet another uh, element of, uh, of of the story. I think I I want to I want to come to Peter now and try to um, um, to keep the track of um, how to improve synergies synergies um, in a situation of unequal partnership. I mean uh, that yeah. is yeah and. Yeah. Well, maybe you should first reflect and then I might come back with some more okay. questions. Can, or with can, can I, I just say that, you know, occupational health professionals, safety professionals, we have awareness of business process. We're used to visiting the dark arts, you know, in terms of workplaces and, and looking at what the person actually does, understanding what that person fits into a, a, a work process. I mean, we, we were aware that, you know, operational capability was being undermined by some of the perhaps um, uh, top down, uh, 
you know, guidelines in terms of it was uh, fueling infection in, 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 in workplaces. It was um, going out into the community and rippling back. And, and um, I think there is, you, you know, the Society of Occupational Medicine in the UK had a slogan a number of years ago in terms of a programme um, which looked at the, the, the wider you know, health promotional aspects of it. Good health is good business. And I mean, that sold as a stock market um, metric in terms of, uh, you, you know, uh, corporate governance and, and um, corporate social responsibility and that uh, that has legal reputational moral community um, issues um, in that, you know, business uh, sustainability and, and even recruiting now because like we're facing um you, you know four and a half thousand healthcare workers out per week in in the irish health service because of either chronic disability or it's due to um you know the fact that they've had recent contact or they have um uh, you, you know uh, been affected by 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 the the pandemic and and that's potentially impacting on our ability to maintain services in the face of the, the, this new variant. So um, I, I do think that, you know, as, as Chris said, I mean, we, we do have particular skill set that was rebuffed, was um, almost denigrated. We, we weren't included in any of the guideline development, but we were handed tasks by, you know, public health national bodies that we, we had no consultation or agreement about, um, you, you know, whether it was fit for purpose or appropriate w was not really um, dealt with. And, and um, you, you know, we're finding at this stage of the pandemic that what we said from the outset in terms of the evidence of airborne spread, in terms of asymptomatic transmission, etc., has all come to fruition. But, you know, our advocacy for the aerosol scientists, the occupational hygienists who go out and do the measurement in the workplaces, the health and safety practitioners, they were not part of these um, national bodies. It was certainly not in, in Ireland initially. Now, the government has made attempts to, because the public outcry or, you know, has been such that there's been demands that they be included. Um, but uh, y yes, I mean, uh, my mentor, Professor Agius said, um, he gave a presentation, I think, to the British Occupational Hygiene Foundation, where he talked about evidence by eminence as opposed to evidence by, you know, actual scientific um, validity and, and, and looking at the evidence that becomes available over time through, through the pandemic. You, you know, we were all caught at the outset although the Chinese seemed to respond and perhaps the Koreans did because they had um, experience with SARS-1 and MERS-CoV. But, um, you know, the, the, the recommendations of even using FFP2 masks in Ireland didn't come in the health service, you know, till the end of January 2021. So, yeah, the OSH voice and the place at the table. And I, I mean, I, I do think that employment has a, you know, a setting or as a, a variable in terms of uh, population health is, 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 you know, crucial, is critical. Um, but uh, I mean, how do we get our voice heard? Because I think as Chris says, you know, in terms of our paradigms, um, we're looking at, you know, the global picture <laughs> through, through different telescopes. Uh, and uh, trying to get that across to our local public health practitioners um, through the pandemic in relation to particular outbreaks, you could see that that hierarchy of control, source, pathway, you know, receptor, the person exposed controls was alien to them. And then we saw organizations like, um, you, you know, the microbiologists and the uh, uh, infection control people taking that paradigm and mixing it up because they weren't clear on, you know, the sequential nature of it and the integrative nature of it in terms of how, how it, it controls risks. So, I, I think it's crucially important, but there's a, an issue of equity, and I think there's a, a coming to a common understanding of, of, of where we're both coming from. Yeah, thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, Peter. That is uh, really a clear diagnosis of the situation. I hear uh, sidelined, I hear denigration, I hear uh, how do we get our voice heard, decisions are being made 
by public health experts that maybe take on board some hierarchy of prevention, but in a very awkward or, you know, not very adequate way. And uh, it's something I recognize also from my work in uh, uh, here in, uh, in Brussels and in Luxembourg in, uh, in the political area. I mean, um, yeah, um, uh, Orsh elements uh, uh, have not been taken on board uh, in, uh, in the context of the biological agents uh, directive revision, for example. It's, uh, it's another example of just not taking into account the practices, the real work practices uh, uh, in the workplace, um, and then you know, forgetting that the workplace has specific characteristics that um, foster contamination and, uh, and, and that we should act on those specific elements. Um, I just, Scott, I don't know if you have a reaction to this, but if you would have a reaction to this, I would be interested. It's, uh, the question is how to bridge this, how to, well, how to bridge, uh, uh, and, and it's, um, not only on the theoretical level, not only uh, uh, you know we can we can agree on it's so logic that we should uh, uh, get together, but um, how to make that practical? Is there something in governance that should be changed? Is there is there other forms of cooperation? I'm I don't know if you can say anything about that uh, because I don't know exactly your expertise uh, field, but uh, yeah, maybe a short reaction. So I'm a political scientist is my expertise. So I, I get happier the closer I get to really terrible people in nice suits. Um, I think one point is that in terms of sidelining, this, this really should be a, a therapy session because if you go through country by country, public health expertise also frequently got sidelined. The people who got the ear of government are microbiologists, virologists, epidemiologists, and modelers. And what they have in common is that they make the virus the protagonist, not the people. And that works great when you're trying to create a vaccine. And it's less effective when you're trying to figure out how airflow and social behavior in a restaurant affects the, the health of the cooks. So the big failure in many ways was self-imposed by governments. And it was a failure to use social science expertise. And in some cases, you can see a good political reason for that, but in other cases, things like the you know stay two meters apart. That that's great if you want to provide prevent tuberculosis, but we now know it's not super useful, and we know that because it only took us a year and a half to discover there's a field called aerosol science. Very interesting, apparently. And of course, Peter said you know this is an area of OSH that is well developed, and it was, let's say it was news to a lot of people in public health. The broader takeaway, I would say, is there's two things. One is conceptual, which is that politicians who ought to be very aware of social factors wanted technological people who would tell them about scientific people, medical people who would tell them about the virus, not social behavior. And that led to a lot of mistakes, right? That's why we spent much of 2020 preventing a flu outbreak when we had a COVID problem. And the other is political, which is that when I spoke about coalitions, how do you reframe the problem? Because the problem is currently framed in most cases as I own a slaughterhouse and I do what I like with my work employees based on my business logic and my regulatory environment. And how do you frame that into the slaughterhouse is part of society and infections come and go and they can teach us different things about how to protect the society and how to protect the workplace. And who are the coalitions that matter? Because once we see the slaughterhouse as part of the community, then there's unions, there's parents' organizations, there's teachers who would like not to have, you know, would like to have children be in a safe community. There's a lot of civil society and a lot of party politics coalitions that could potentially open up for us. And I think that's the way to go, is that if you're not making enough headway within your, I'll put it this way and then I'll stop. The scope of conflict is the crucial determinant of political outcomes. Who is involved in the fight? And if the fight is only perceived as being between workers and employers in a given plant, and the workers are losing, then the workers need new allies. Right? You bring new people in when you're losing a fight. 
And I think that's arguably the case for both public health and OSH at the moment, is that the scope of conflict got defined in a way that meant that our advice wasn't listened to. And frankly, a lot of really predictable and bad things happened as a result. So we need to think about broader coalitions and breaking this barrier between workplace and public health is possibly a way to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Very wise words uh, and uh, a really helpful and nice, uh, uh, interesting comment. Uh, you know, you brought in also the, 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 the topic to the failure of the use of social science expertise, a well-known fact in this uh, pandemic uh, indeed. And, uh, and broadening the coalitions. It's, uh, uh, now I want to give uh, the audience uh, the opportunity to uh, raise some questions. That is, I hope they have put some questions in the Q&A and that Paula can uh, bring them to us. Paula, you have the floor. Thank you, Marion, and thank you to the speakers. It is very, very interesting, and there has been remarks uh, throughout the, the discussion just highlighting about the, the interesting points. Um, there are a couple of questions. Um, uh, there is uh, Louis Le Rouge is asking um, that, do you think that public health prevention and occupational health prevention are the same? And, and he's suggesting that public health addresses occupational health promotion at an individual level more than occupational health, which supports the elimination of occupational risks and focuses on the primary prevention at a collective level. So what, what is your perception and, and take on this? And um, then uh, just the uh, uh, a second question, and that's coming from me. I can't hold my tongue anymore because uh, it's, it's very interesting. So um, I, uh, uh, Scott was saying about the, the, the kind of the common ground, the common interest is, the, is health. This is what's for OSH and public health. And, and listening to the, the discussions and the presentations, it sounds like the common enemy is the governance, the decision-making structures. And I, I, I think from, from this one, um, just to sort of what Marianne was pointing out and, and Peter as well has given a lot of examples that the, the OSH expert were sidelined in the pandemic and their advice were not taken on board. But perhaps the question would be where the expertise should be taken on board. Is it between the public health experts and the OSH experts or is it actually more at the decision-making level and how does that then work? And maybe there is a synergy uh, following from Scott was saying, between the public health and OSH in terms of getting those messages and those technical aspects to the decision makers that really make a difference to workers' health. So those are the, the, the two to go by. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Paula. I was, can I have a question? Uh, yes, you have a privilege, Ord. You have a privilege. Ord will uh, uh, also add a question because she is uh, the only one in real life that is present. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, can you hear me well even with the mask? No. Wait, oh. Health and safety measures, we just, yeah. you know. Uh, hi, thanks to all of you for your contribution. Uh, I have especially like a remarking question to uh, Peter. So you talk about like risk tolerance and what is acceptable and unacceptable and all of this. And you even say like, well, basically, the question is how far is the employer responsible uh, for the health of the workers. If I remember well, at least in the UK, I don't know if it's the same in Ireland, but the employer is responsible for the health and safety of, pe of people impacted by the way they conduct their businesses. And here my question is, in the context of global pandemic, can we consider that actually they had and they have a responsibility to prevent not only the workers and the impact on the family, but also the way they conduct their business will impact the entire society and the most vulnerable one. So will it be a moment here to actually in, uh, interpret in a broader sense uh, the responsibility of the employer in terms of health and safety and making the link finally maybe between OSH and public health? Thank you. Okay, we are, um, this is three questions and they are all very interesting. We have uh, 11 more minutes. So, um, I give the floor to um, Peter first, and please pick um, one or two questions that you find the most, uh, you know, fit for you. Can I just deal with the last one? And um, I, I agree. I mean, I think the risk that arises out of a direct connection with the workplace, we've seen the studies, you know, that show the particular occupational groups you know, we're, we're at risk and there were settings for transmission. So 
I think if employers, you know, were able to discharge their duties under health and safety regulations to control that excess occupational, you, you know, uh, risk, uh, I think that translates into benefits for the wider community because we we did see in the ONS state in the UK that the families of the healthcare workers that were particularly at risk in the first wave, they were seven times more likely to be infected or to die than the general population. They're those workers, their family members were three times more likely to get infected as a result of healthcare workers bringing it home. And certainly in our own experience, we see that that affected operational capability. Um, I mean, we see it, I put up the sides of asbestos and the approach to asbestos control, like it was the family members of the asbestos workers in Turner, Newell and Leeds, um, you know, in the 50s, 60s, that the worker brought home their overalls and they, they, they laundered the overalls and, and they inhaled the dust and they got the asbestosis, mesothelioma, the lung cancer associated with the fibrotic dust exposure. And we have this in relation to COVID is, is um, you, you know, is COVID an occupational disease or not? Or is it, you know, a pandemic that um, we can't isolate the community transmission from the workplace? Well, there are occupations that are at excess risk, so we can do something about their risk. There's a study by Ferris from Cambridge where they, they gave FFP2s and FFP3s on the red COVID um, you know, treatment pathway wards for, for, for the staff, and it brought the level of, of um, infection down to community transmission level. The question I had because of transmission from healthcare worker to healthcare worker coming from community exposure was, well, if we give an FFP2 to all staff on the green pathways as well, and on maybe the, you know, areas where you're in close proximity with your colleagues in non-patient facing roles, could that bring it even to below, um, you know, community transmission level? Because we do have workforces, radiation workers who have a healthy worker effect and they have much better health outcomes because they have that holistic, you know, approach to, to, to workplace health that um, they have, um, you know, much better uh, health outcomes and, and maybe that selection effects in terms of, but it, it may also be nurture in the context of, of you know, the employer's um, emphasis on, on OSH in the broader sense, encompassing health that, uh, you know, has ripples out into the communities that those uh, people serve. And I've spoken about, um, you know, sustainable business and, and sustainability in an environmental sense in a, in a you know in a wider um population health sense and, and i think as we say the you know employment as a factor in that needs to be uh, considered more strongly and and i do agree with you um i think if we you know keep workers safe that is benefit for communities and and that creates stronger alliances in the round so i hope i've answered your question thank you thank Thank you very much. And then, um, uh, Scott, um, I uh, want to give you the floor. I hope uh, it, it, the, the two other questions maybe, um, is public health prevention the same as OS prevention? And um, who, uh, where should uh, the connection be made? That's, uh, I think, uh, well, in, in very simple words, uh, uh, the two questions, I hope I, I value them enough, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, please. I'll give you a conceptual answer, but I don't want to take responsibility for the way any given bureaucracy implements it somewhere in the world because I'll look silly. Um, the two forms of prevention should be the same, except they're working with quite different contexts, right? So public health is going to know less about the process typically and much more about kind of population level dynamics and probabilities which means that we're going to miss a lot of things that look important if you're focused on a particular set of workers in a process. And that's one reason that there's a strong case for partnership because we're, not, we're set up fundamentally with an epidemiological population level probabilistic mindset. And that's not the same thing as aiming for zero accidents in a steel mill. And I would add on this, by the way, one of the key arguments for partnership, and this is a, a level of neoliberalism so deep that it's in most people's heads by now, is that employers understand the workplace and therefore employers should be invited in to have conversations about maximizing safety. Well, hold on a second. 
we know employers have systematic interests that might or might not produce employee health and safety. The way you get additional information is by creating a cadre of professional inspectors who understand the industry as well as the employers. So when you cut back on the labor inspectorates, what you're doing is not just reducing the number of people who can go visit a factory, you're reducing the number of people who understand the factory well enough to inform policy and practice. So one of the things that I think you might say is that a lot of essential workers are really very, very disaffected now. And there's a lot of sympathy for them. And a lot of employers have used up a lot of the public sympathy that they had. And one simple argument might be that we need to strengthen the labor inspectorates, which would have the short-term benefit of finding safe, you know, unsafe workplaces, but the longer term benefit of making sure that the employers don't have the monopoly of knowledge of what's going on in so many workplaces. Because if you're not a well unionized workplace, the only person who formally understands and can insert knowledge into the process of policymaking is the employer. And they're going to do that following the logic of the company doctor, not the population. So I think that was my happy ending. Thank you very much, Paula. Do you have uh, any additional remarks or questions? We have uh, four more minutes. So uh, it, does this answer the question? Uh, it, it does answer. I, I guess yes, absolutely. I think it's uh, I think it's a very very good point. And in terms of especially in the uh, in the context of um, of the pandemic and before the pandemic, the more precarious. Uh, employment uh, um, would be the most uh, prone to um, very prone to accidents and and uh, negative impacts on people's health in the long term, and that would be exactly these would be the workplaces where there would be um, uh, fewer inspections. There there there, there would be um, the workforce would not be um, organized. Um, for example, in the let's say the elderly care sector that is being heavily privatized. So these kind of issues, so it's all coming together to actually um, what uh, Klaus Mikal started saying about the neoliberal uh, politics, the focus on individual, on the, on the, on the responsibility of the individual, kind of uh, eradicating the, the, the base for the uh, labor inspectorates, austerity measures. So it's, it's, a, it's a bigger issue there. And I think that's, that's kind of following what Scott has been saying, is that, that there are the synergies that can be found and it's it's perhaps at the more of the decision making level, and it's it's very much about the powers uh, um, and in in the decision making level rather than between the uh, expert, experts in OSH or experts in public health, and then being uh, against each other's definition of 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 prevention. It's just a, a matter of, of finding uh, finding the common ground there. But um, in terms of questions from the audience, I think that's it. Uh, the the speakers have. Uh, being exhaustive of their uh, descriptions and their presentations, I think it's uh, it's provided a lot of food for thought, and hopefully uh, interest to get in touch with each other and 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 develop the agenda and keep on the the debate and the discussion. So that I can see that Peter um, still wants to um, uh, contribute. So yes, that's all from me. Just very briefly, with with the you know lack of data and and the lack of inclusion of employment. You know, within hospital data, in terms of emergency department data, family practitioner data, um, in general public health data, employment as a variable is not often always or very often included. And I think we have a big data gap. Um, we can see that in, in the Lane lecture in, in, in the UK by, by Leslie Rushton, who, who just commented that the investment in, in occupational health health studies are, are in terms of you know the, the inclusion of, of employment as, as a variable in health is is a blind spot uh, and just a call for that thanks I think that's a very politically determined blind spot it's not that we're all stupid it's that it would reveal things that powerful people don't want us to hear thank you from uh, for a uh, uh, political science science point of view because uh, yeah it's uh, it's not just technical and uh, and and evidence based, but there is power game uh, uh, ongoing also. Yeah, true, true. 
Um, I think, oh, we, uh, we are really perfectly on time. It's one minute to three. So um, the only thing that remains to be done for me is to thank you very, very much for your contribution. I think we had a extremely interesting presentations and a very lively discussion. I am not sure, I'm not even going to try to summarize it at this moment, but I'm sure Paula and I will come back to one another and try to structure things a bit and, uh, and, and we will elaborate uh, on this topic further from uh, ETUI side, because simply it's on the political agenda. It's, it's out there uh, in policy documents everywhere. And, uh, and we thought it uh, wise um, to start this discussion from our side and uh, not wait until uh, some other uh, instances uh, start uh, uh, making the picture, com completing the picture. So, uh, so that's, uh, that has been our strategy and you have been of great help to start this off. So thank you, thank you very much. and. Uh, Paula, you will announce the break and uh, tell us. Uh... Yes, thank you, Marian. Exactly. So now, now we have a half an hour break and we'll continue with the second session of the day, which is about psychosocial risks in telework at 15.30. So see you all then. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.
Oh, good, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the ETUI annual OSH conference. Um, now we will have a session that focuses on psychosocial risks in telework. Uh, the backdrop to this session is that there is a growing consensus that telework is expected to become established and very, very common beyond the pandemic. Now, telework is traditionally defined as the use of information and communication technology, so the ICT, uh, for the purpose of working outside the employer's premises. <clears throat> However, this very narrow definition uh, should be revised as telework is actually a totally different way of organizing and performing work. And therefore, switching to telework requires a reorganization of work. In this context, it is essential to understand the challenges associated with this way of organizing work and also to develop collective measures that address these challenges. Uh, now, one of the major areas of concern in telework is psychosocial risks. And this afternoon, we will hear presentations from three speakers who will provide different perspectives into this topic. Uh, first, we have it uh, with us uh, Blandine Mollard, who is a researcher at the European Institute for Gender Equality, uh, which is one of the European Commission's research agencies. Uh, she will provide us an insight into gender aspects of telework based on the findings from AGES research. Her presentation frames the discussion on telework beyond the pandemic times, as she will talk us through some very interesting and very recent data on digital workforce, platform work and artificial intelligence in relation to telework. Now, the second speaker with us today is Nina Hedegaard Nielsen, who is a senior policy advisor uh, on occupational health and safety uh, at the Danish Trade Union Confederation. Uh, Nina will present key points on psychosocial risks in telework from the OSH perspective and outline organizational and social risk factors in telework, as well as what is needed to manage and prevent psychosocial risks. And our third speaker at the ETUI uh, studio is Aude Cefaliello, who is a researcher at the ETUI. And she will tell us about the European legal background on work-related psychosocial risks. And uh, her presentation is based on her in-depth research into this issue. And you will be the first to receive a link to her brand new publication on this topic. Uh, the link to her policy brief that looks into national examples of psychosocial risk legislation will be shared in the chat box of, of this meeting shortly. So after we have heard uh, the three presentations, uh, we will have time for discussion. So please do write your questions and comments to the presenters into the Q&A box of the Zoom. I will be keeping an eye on it. But now, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Blandin Mollard from Ege. Blandin, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Um, I'm sharing my screen. Do you see it? Do you see the full slide? Yes. OK. Great. So thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Paola. It's, um, and thank you for inviting Eiger to share its research, research findings on some of the main uh, gender issues that we see at play when we talk about telework, and especially in terms of psychosocial uh, risks. So for this presentation, as you mentioned, I will be referring to our recent work on uh, the Gender Equality Index 2020, 2021, the research note that we produced on the socioeconomic impact of COVID-19 and some recent work on artificial intelligence and platform work that we produced for the Slovenian presidency of the European Union. So in this presentation, I would like to start by discussing very briefly who is teleworking in the EU and looking into how the propensity to telework is influenced by broader patterns of gender segregation on the labor market. I would, I would also like to touch upon a category of workers who, while being much talked about and much discussed... Blandin, 
Sorry, this is Paula. Uh, we can see um, your slide, uh, the next slide and the notes as well. Okay, so, so if you yeah, try... I will share the. So let me just check yes. and stop sharing. I will go back to that then. Mm -hmm. So then. Let's try. Maybe so now you see the big the one. Um, now we don't see the slide at all. Oh, yeah. Are you Sorry. working with two screens? I, I find it always challenging. It's, uh, now we can see a wonderful picture of, uh, of Vilnius. Vilnius, yes. yes. And so now, now you see the good. first slide. So I was there. Yes. So um, I was saying that I, I would like to touch upon a categories of workers that is not that's, that does not immediately come to mind when we think of telework, but that is very relevant also to this discussion, and that's platform workers. Because we know this is also a category of workers who is lagging behind in terms of access to union and sometimes even social protection. Then I will uh, discuss briefly some of the main psychosocial risks that we have uh, seen emerging from our work especially in terms of uh, unpaid care work and how unequally distributed it is uh, in the family, acute work-life tensions. Then I will say a few words about the links that we are seeing between artificial intelligence and telework. And finally, uh, a few words about a category of workers that is at risk of exclusion if telework is becoming more and more of a norm. So um, despite the fact that women are overrepresented among essential workers, and by essential workers, I mean the workers whose physical presence in the workplace has been considered uh, required by government in the context of the pandemic. So despite the fact that women are overrepresented among these categories of workers, they are mainly found in the low paid uh, occupations of essential workers. And uh, we see some estimates of uh, about 45% of women and 30% of men in the EU being in occupations that have telework uh, potential. So it doesn't mean that this, uh, this is the prevalence of telework in the EU, it's the potential, the, the ability uh, in those occupations to, to telework. And so that's quite a sizable differences between women and men. And uh, this difference is um, in part relating to patterns on the labor market, especially in terms of occupational and, uh, hori and uh, vertical uh, segregation, with men being overrepresented in uh, sectors with limited potential for telework, for example, agriculture or manufacturing or construction and also women being overrepresented in occupations, regardless of the sector, uh, with lower physical handling of tasks. For example, more secretarial uh, work or administrative um, occupation. So those tend to be more office-based, so easier to, uh, to transfer to, to telework. In, um, in our work, uh, at the moment for the, towards the Gender Equality Index 2022, we have seen that the largest increase in the uptake of telework since the outbreak has been among women with children, which is uh, very, uh, not very surprising given the school closures. And uh... so in terms of platform workers, we have, uh, we have uh, conducted a survey in 10 uh, member states to, uh, to understand the working conditions, the work patterns and the work-life balance issues that uh, platform workers are facing. And what we found in our survey of about 5,000 platform workers is that the typical profile is, uh, is a young person highly educated and with care responsibilities. You see uh, some of the main statistics uh, and characteristics of the platform workers who responded to the survey. And what we see also is that um, around a third of uh, respondents have either started or restarted working on digital platforms as a result of the pandemic. So either as the main source of income or as a side, um, as a side uh, gig. We also see that um, even if we have this image of uh, the typical platform worker being working in delivery, there is really a great diversity of, of tasks and occupations uh, conducted through platform work and uh, home-based and telework is actually a very common arrangement for a sizable part of platform workers. To give you an example, 
This is um, so, some of a list of example of the home-based home -based, uh, home -based tasks that are conducted on digital labor platforms. So it shows you a great diversity from, uh, from translation work to uh, software development or teaching or counseling. And this also shows you the gender makeup of each other occupation for platform workers. So platform workers are a sizable, um, a, a big category of, uh, of teleworkers as well. And the most, uh, the leading motivating factors for professionals or for workers to, to join digital platforms and to work as, uh, as platform workers are the three leading ones are first income, um, supplementing or just um, earning an income, work flexibility, choosing when and where to work and uh, work-life balance. So then we'll see a bit later into what extent those, uh, those motivation factors, those uh, ambitions have been realized um, or not. So moving on to the main psychosocial risks that we see as a result of the, the telework and from a gender perspective, basically um, we have seen that overall the, the shift to telework due to the pandemic was obviously accompanied with childcare services and uh, the help from neighbors and grandparents being entirely disrupted. So the tele pandemic teleworking has been accompanied with a sharp increase in unpaid, uh, unpaid work for working parents and other workers with care responsibilities. This is due to the, the request to, to combine paid work and unpaid care at the same time and in the same place. So in particular, uh, managing the demands of online uh, schooling has emerged as, as a new additional form of unpaid care and not the most pleasant one for, <laughs> if I can speak of uh, my own experience. And like many forms of unpaid care, it has uh, been unequally shared and it has been mainly shouldered uh, by women. We have seen that this um, rise in unpaid care has affected women and men, and we've seen also an increase in, in fathers' uh, participation in unpaid care, for example, in childcare or housework. But this was mainly for, uh, in the case of fathers who were physically at home, either because they were teleworking as well or because they had lost uh, their job during the pandemic. So those, uh, those phenomena need to be you know, confirmed uh, over time, there has there's, there is some emerging evidence. So we, we will need to see if this is something that is sustained in time or, or just um, temporary. But overall, we see that uh, working mothers with young children, especially under five, have faced some of the hardest uh, work-life balance cha uh, challenges as a result of uh, telework combined with un increased uh, unpaid care. We're also noticing some other, other effects of telework on, uh, especially on, on workers' ability to focus and to, uh, to combine uh, their work with their family responsibilities. Or we see uh, some very uh, significant uh, gender differences in teleworking patterns. There are some, some different research showing that uh, uh, during lockdown, especially this one, uh, the, this example here on the slide from the UK, showing that during lockdown, uh, mothers uh, are being interrupted in their work 50% more often than fathers, showing that um, the entrenched gender roles, um, showing that, uh, that children are much more likely to go interrupt uh, their mothers than their father when they, they, they need something. So this has had, of course, an impact on productivity and potentially down the line some promotional consequences. We also see some differences uh, in terms of access to equipment and home facilities, uh, in terms of who is uh, having a dedicated space to telework, who is using the dinner table instead, uh, who is using the family computer or a specific laptop. Of course, uh, now more and more employers are either subsiding, um, providing subsidies or providing equipment, but uh, at least at the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, workers were, were expected to provide, to use their own equipment. So we've seen a lot of uh, unequal access 
to uh, to uh, to equipment in that in that sense with um, in general uh, men's uh, career or work commitments taking a priority and uh, and women's one taking a bit of a sideline as a consequence there is also increasing evidence from countries showing that labor market exits um, have been much higher among uh, women. So there is uh, quite a risk of uh, detachment from the labor, labor market. Of course, that cannot be only from, from women who were teleworking, but this is an additional sign of, uh, of some of the, the risk accumulating into uh, resignation or just uh, removing uh, oneself from the labor market. So overall, we see an accumulation of physical and uh, mental pressures among uh, working parents, especially uh, women. So coming back to platform workers, and if you remember some of the, the biggest motivation factor for, for workers uh, to, to join online, uh, online platforms, uh, one of them was flexibility and the ability to choose where they work uh, and, uh, and when they work. So our research shows that actually there is very easy entry, but the, the flexibility is, actually, is not a lived reality, at least for the workers. It's, it's probably very much present for the platforms themselves, but uh, the platform workers are not experiencing this um, this control over their working hours that they were maybe expecting. So what we see is that 36% of the, the women and 40% of the men who responded to the survey um, often or always work nights and, and weekends with uh, unpredictable hours. So many of them are unable to choose when to work and, um, and the hours tend to be scattered throughout the day without a proper uh, work day. Uh, which make uh, combining with uh, care responsibilities particularly difficult. There is also evidence of some uh, algorithmic uh, uh, penalties for interrupted work, which are obviously detrimental to combining work uh, with care responsibilities. So in other words, the platforms are rewarding the, the workers who are available all the time and, and penalizing those who are disconnecting uh, to, to focus on other things. So the, the report uh, from which this evidence is coming is under publication at the moment, but uh, uh, I've put the link here to the policy brief that we have published uh, on uh, the main findings of this, this research on artificial intelligence and uh, platform work. Another aspect that I wanted to mention today is the fact that we see some growing uh, links between uh, artificial intelligence technologies and telework. In particular, um, for artificial intelligence to, to, to succeed, uh, it requires a lot of actually a lot of labor uh, and especially low skilled labor to, uh, to label a large amount of data for AI to recognize, recognize the patterns in data. So this has led to the emergence of, of new jobs who are mostly done from home, uh, especially data labelers. And, uh, and those jobs tend to be, uh, tend to be lower sk skilled and uh, undervalued. And we see that most of the, the majority of workers in these roles um, are women or people of underprivileged background. So this is another category of workers that uh, while teleworking might not fit the general idea of uh, you know, the white collar professional who, who is quite privileged on the labor market. Another link that we're seeing between the two phenomena is um, the fact that there is increasing uh, monitoring and surveillance of employees on telework. So this, uh, this is also another phenomenon that can penalize teleworkers who are, for example, who step out from their desk to attend their children or who are being interrupted. So this is another way that artificial intelligence is creating risks for, for teleworkers. And finally, we also see some evidence of uh, algorithmic, algorithmic uh, performance review being used increasingly in many, many sectors, including for those working on platform work, but also call centers and, and other sectors. 
and uh, and the the issue potentially with this this tendency this this trend is that um, it it reflects the customer biases so if your performance review is basic is very heavily based on the, on ratings or on reviews you may be um, at a disadvantage uh, because that may reflect the biases of the customer in terms of gender or age or the grounds my last point in terms of uh, the some of the risks that are associated with telework is the fact that um, the massive shift uh, towards telework has led to uh, very rapid uptake of new technologies. It has really transformed the way we work. Um, and in case telework becomes more common, as you were saying, Paola, it could lead to a divide between those who can thrive in the context of, uh, of telework and those who either don't have access to telework options or who are maybe struggling a little bit more with that uh, way of work. And such divide can come from either your sector because the, the nature of your work is just not prone to telework, but it can also come from um, digital skills. So we can see on the slide that um, in orange is the share of people, men and women by age, who have low uh, digital skills. And uh, if this, uh, this share of people is quite low for, for younger workers, like 16, 24, it, uh, it increases uh, with age. And we also see that the gender, gender differences also widens with age. So there is a risk that uh, certain categories of workers, especially uh, women with low education um, and older workers might not be as comfortable with the technologies needed for telework as, uh, as other workers. We also know that, um, that women with low education have uh, faced specific barriers to accessing training. So upskilling your digital skills might not be so, so easy and so, so fast. So at least uh, the, the European, um, the Digital Education Action Plan could provide an opportunity for addressing this, uh, this potential uh, gap. Uh, otherwise, there is a risk of uh, a category of worker really uh, lagging behind or missing out on the opportunities for, for telework or um, further career advancement. Finally, I just want to say a word on the fact that we have uh, new evidence coming in the context of the Gender Equality Index 2022, because we are currently uh, conducting a survey on um, broadly the gender equality and uh, socioeconomic consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. We have collected data from over 42,000 um, respondents across the, the EU. And uh, we have started analyzing uh, the results. Basically, we are looking into how paid and unpaid work has uh, changed for women and men during the pandemic. So telework will be featured in, uh, in the, the report coming out from the, this work. Um, also, the, uh, the effects on unpaid work, on uh, promotional, um, on career advancement opportunities. So we're looking forward to discussing about those, those aspects more in the future. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to, to any question later. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Blondine. It was a, uh, it was a very, um, very good framing uh, for the discussion in terms of the, the challenges related to the, the, the broader transformation or the digital transformation of the world of work and, and, and how the risks relate to, that the psychosocial risks uh, could appear and be um, uh, further prompted by the transformation. And in terms of the data that you presented, it is, is very interesting and gives, gives us some pointers in terms of um, what you mentioned, platform workers are actually a big category of teleworkers, and this is not necessarily only the white collar workers, so, so uh, these, these kind of issues uh, definitely play a role there or um, one third of the, the, the survey uh, <clears throat> respondents started or restarted working on a digital platform during the pandemic. So again, something that we can see a big transformation 
and links to telework, home-based telework, remote work. So just starting from the fundamentals of understanding what we are discussing here and how many workers are actually impacted uh, by, by these, uh, these issues. Um, so thank you very much, Landin. Uh, we will now move on to our second speaker, uh, Nina Hedegaard Nielsen. So please, Nina, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello. Thank you, Paula. Can you hear me? No? Yes, yes, yes very well. <laughs> thank you. Uh, good. Well, I, I will also start by sharing uh, my screen. Um, here, just need to get large. And uh, and thanks uh, a lot for the invitation and uh, for an interesting conference. I think uh, one thing that's not in my slide, but uh, that I feel happened more and more is that now we are attending uh, uh, mutual meetings at the same time. I was actually just in the break attending another meeting, <laughs> uh, uh, an, an ILO meeting on the, um, like the same as Christy Mister uh, on new guidelines on occupational health and safety. and. Uh, Kind of think that maybe later on we'll get some uh, some research also on what that does for our psychosocial risks that we now can jump in and out and, and meetings at the same time. So, um, but but that's not the part of uh, of this presentation today. So, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is uh, Nina Nielsen and I'm a senior policy advisor uh, on occupational health and safety at the Danish Trade Union Confederation. Um, and I'm also trained as an occupational psychologist, so I've always worked worked with the psychosocial risks, also with other health, occupational health and safety. But uh, psychosocial risk is like uh, the first thing I ever dealt with, and I always uh, still that's kind of closest to my heart. So, so I'm always happy when I get to say something about that. Um, so of course I'll go I'll go through the presentation, and then hopefully questions and comments afterwards. Um, so first of all, I think it's always important to, to just to stop and say, what is it actually that we mean by psychosocial risks? Uh, and this here, uh, this definition is, is one I found uh, in the EU OSHA, the uh, uh, agencies, uh, OSWIKI, uh, and I think it's quite good, uh, um, a good definition and also definition that is um, kind of validated by, by experts. So, so, so basically what's important here is that psychosocial risks refers to the likelihood that work-related psychosocial hazards will have a negative impact on employees' health and safety through their perception and experience. So, so I think, so here, here we say that the risks relate to the likelihood that the hazards will have a negative impact. So, so also what is also important here are the hazards in the working environment. So, so that's one important thing. And then it goes on about saying that psychosocial hazards concerns the design of management of work and its social and organizational context that have the potential for causing psychological or physical harm. So again, we are in the context of work, we're in the management of work, and we're in the social part of work. And also, what is also important to highlight here is you can also have physical harm, not just psychological harm. Um, I think one thing that is also um, interesting and increasingly something that is spoken about is for example occupational suicides so that you so that you actually because of uh, maybe your psychosocial risks end up by taking your own life so that's kind of a part of us uh, the ultimate um, ultimate uh, what you call that uh, risk from psychosocial risks so but but keeping this in mind I think that's that's always important because there's so many different ways of uh, of defining psychosocial risks and, and people think of different things when we talk about it. Um, before I get to the telework part, that is, is really uh, what I was asked to talk about, I just want to say that we have to also remember that psychosocial risk was also a problem before we had COVID-19. Uh, and I think Mayan said that really well in the beginning, that, uh, that COVID-19 is just, uh, just showing us, uh, it's just like putting a big, um, what do you call that magnifying glass on something that was already there. So here you see the numbers that are in, um, in the new EU strategic framework and it, it, it dates all the way back to 2017 of what people die from when we talk about workers die from, from occupational health and safety. So here you see the, the biggest killer is cancer, 
And then you have circulatory um, diseases with 24%. Uh, you have injuries, that's 2%. So that's, that's accidents, basically. And then you have others, 22%. And in that others category here, we have some of the mental health issues uh, that actually lead to death. And also, of course, the circulatory is also an area where we know that there's a link between, uh, for example, stress and the circulatory diseases. So, so the problem is 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 is, is difficult to it's difficult to exactly pinpoint uh, what is psychosocial risk causing here, but it's it's definitely interesting to see that what workers are dying for are the diseases, not really the accidents. A little bit more uh, on on the problem before COVID nineteen, and this is from the same uh, uh, publication, the the new EU strategic framework. So it's official. Uh, uh, numbers from the Commission. And first of all, over a quarter of workers in Europe have experienced excessive work-related stress. So, so that's really high number. And 51% uh, of EU workers say stress is coming in the, common in their workplace. Nearly 80% of managers are concerned about work-related stress. And then also what Audible, I don't know, we'll talk about later is that there are significant variations between the member states' legislation on psychosocial risks. So we have a big problem, but we have very, very different way of dealing with it uh, throughout Europe. Um, so um, coming to uh, psychosocial risk when teleworking, I, I think it's very important to, to look at it uh, in a way of saying, we know that there are actually pros, there are good things for the psychosocial risk or the psychosocial work environment, and also there are negative things. So, uh, so if you look at the pros first, uh, we have more control over work organization. When we work from home, there's more flexibility, which of course lots of workers also highlight. It's easier uh, to, um, to navigate uh, between the, the family life and the, uh, and the private life and, and the work life, and also to decide what to do when. Of course, no transport. That is what, when we, we made this, a survey where, where I work in Danish Trade Union Con, uh, Federation, and the highest, the one that was like, was the, the, the biggest one, uh, the biggest score on, on the pros was no transport, no time spent on transport. But also another one was let, less interruptions, better able to concentrate, especially when people, people work in uh, open space offices, and then they can go home and, and they can have, uh, have less interruptions and, and uh, it's, it's easier to concentrate. So that also links to the next one is which is more efficient use of time and, uh, and also better work-life balance. So that's also connected to, to the first one. So that is what workers say when we ask them in Denmark. So what, what do you like about uh, working from, from teleworking? And then of course, also there are the cons. What are, are, the, what are the things that, that doesn't really work or, or, the, or the risks you could also say. So the first one, uh, uh, important one when you talk about psychosocial risk is isolation. Uh, we hear that a lot and I'll come back to some numbers from you found uh, just in a minute on isolation and the loss of support from colleague, colleagues and managers, which of course is a really important part of psychosocial risk that you have to support. Um, and also that you don't feel isolated when you work. Another one that's very prevalent is longer working hours and working in, in, the, in your spare time. Uh, that's also really comes out uh, quite clearly. And then we have work-life balance is threatened. And then you see you have on both sides, both on pros and on cons, I put work-life balance. And that's where it, it gets, I think, also interested and, 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 and not so, so easy because on one hand, Workers feel that they can better control the work-life balance. Uh, they can, if they have to go to the doctor with the kids, they can do that in the morning and then they can work in the afternoon or not in the evening, for example. So, so that's, on the, that's on the pros, but on the cons, that, that we also see that work is like everywhere. And, and even the fact that you have to work in your home also makes it very difficult to set the boundaries between when you're at work and when you are at home. Um, and, and off work. So the next one is, is, a, is a little bit more tricky, but that's uh, something a researcher in Denmark has, has found uh, quite a few times. Uh, also that work loses its value. It's, it's in, there are more unclear demands. It's difficult to keep focus and works become uninteresting. 
So, so kind of you lose, a lot of workers lose motivation. They don't find the work so interesting. The fact that you take it out of its social context with the colleagues, with the managers, and also you don't have that dialogue all the time in the workplace about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what are the goals, what are the targets, what are you trying to aim for? That also, that has an effect on, 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 on kind of the feeling of work not being so important or so meaningful anymore. Um, then I've, I've put a few sort of things we need. These are, this, these are not risk factors. These are more categories of workers that we see we have to be, be careful about or we have to keep, uh, keep an eye on or pay more attention to. Maybe that's better to put it that way. And that's young and newly hired uh, workers. They're more affected. And I think it's, it's quite logical because when you're new or you're young and you don't quite know what to, to do, it's unclear for you when you, your work is done, uh, done to the, uh, what do you call it, it's when it's good enough, when, you, when you've done your work uh, as expected. That's, that's much harder for younger, younger workers. And also they can be much more isolated because they don't know their colleagues uh, that well yet if they even know them. And also workers that were hired during the pandemics and maybe they never even went to the office and just started working from home. And of course we have uh, also vulnerable workers, precarious work, and um, we already heard a lot about that. So I don't want to say more about that, but the vulnerable workers are just mostly affected on all measures in, in general. So moving on for that, um, then I, I, if I, I go a bit more into the, the pros, what are the positive things here? And I think uh, you found has made uh, some, some really interesting research here. And then they, they published this article. Uh, you, you can also find it on, on uh, you can Google it and find it, but just the title I think is, is, is really interesting because they say workers want to telework, but long working hours, isolation and inadequate equipment must be tackled. So, so here in, in just this title, I think we have a lot uh, already on what to do. So it's not to say that you should not telework because there's a lot of pros in that, but you need to really focus on the long working hours and the isolation. Um, so, so, so that's really what's key here. So, so but you can see 75% strongly agree uh, or agree that overall I'm satisfied with the experience working from home. So that's your find that finds that. Uh, moving on also to some other findings from you, uh, you found, they also say that 60% in the EU would like to telework regularly after the uh, pandemic. So, so the pandemic has clearly uh, made it more interesting or shown workers that this is, this is something that we can do and, and we like to do it. Um, so, but you can also see it's not, it's not just about, it's not uh, teleworking daily. This is, there's quite a big difference between the member states on how often the workers want to telework. Uh, and if you look at the average, it's 18% who says they want to do it daily, but it's 43% that says several times a week and 31% that says less often. So, so uh, it also means that most workers or shows that most workers want to have this what we now call hybrid work. So they're both teleworking and working in the office. If that's possible. So here now I'm moving on to some of the, the cons, some of, some of uh, the negative findings or the hazards in, in psychosocial risks when teleworking. And here you can see the share of employees working more than 40 hours a week. That is much, much higher when you're working from home only, or even if you're working from home partially than if you're working in the employer's premises. So, so clearly uh, we see that there is uh, a tendency to work uh, more hours when you work from home. Um, you can also see uh, that uh, when working from home, uh, it's, sorry, it's just because I have some bar here, so I can't really see the slide, just a second. Share of employees working during free time every day or every other day, uh, by place of work. So who actually works when they're supposed to be off work and what's the correlation between that and between where you work. And again, we can see if you work from home or if you work in the hybrid model, they're almost the same, then you have a tendency to work much more in your spare time. Uh, and here you can see only employers, that's if you only work in the employer's office, then you, the, the, it, it's just much slower. So again, we see 
that you work workers work more when they work from home. Um, yes, so moving on to the next slide. So, um, and this is this slide shows a bit the same, but with some other words. So maybe it's it's, it's a bit easier also to to grasp. So people who regularly work from home are more than twice as likely to work more than forty eight hours per per week. So so that's quite a lot forty hours uh, forty eight hours uh, per week, and they're also at risk of resting for less than eleven hours. So uh, the regulation we have in the EU about that is is much more uh, at stake here when you work from home. And also almost 30% of teleworkers report working in their free time every day or several times a week. So basically shows the same again. Um, and here this slide shows the percentage of uh, full-time employees feeling isolated at work. Uh, uh, and uh, wait a minute, um, by hours work from home. So, so here you can see the more you work from home, the more isolated you feel. So again, this is uh, just showing uh, what is it exactly the, that you have found has found here? So there's a clear uh, there's a clear correlation between the amount of hours you work from home uh, and uh, and whether you feel isolated. So again, if you work from home, it's I think it's quite important that you don't work from home constantly. Every that you also uh, go to the office to to uh, mitigate the feeling of isolation. Yeah. Wait a second. Again, also isolation here and feel and feeling drained by weekly hours work from home. So here we both, so here we we see both the isolation. So that's that's the same as we saw before, on the green bar. But on the red bar now, you can see that at workers are also emotionally drained by work the more they work from home, and and it's it seems like it's it it comes when you work more than forty eight hours per week. So basically, when you when you do that over time, because you should say 40 hours per week, that should sort of be the normal working time. You shouldn't work more than 40 hours per week in general. So when you when you get above that, you will also feel emotionally drained, but you won't, it, it, it just if, if you're below that, you'll be fine. And so it's not this exactly the same as isolated, which is increasing by the hours you, you, work, uh, you work from home. So um, I always like to end with saying something about solutions so that we don't think, okay, the, here we have a lot of problems. Yeah, we have some pros, we have some cons. I think most important is what do we do about them? And, and this here is, is nothing new. I think you all heard it before, but uh, I think we need to keep repeating this uh, to ourselves that what is it that we want to do to deal with this? And first of all, yeah, we would like to see to have a directive on psychosocial risks at work. Uh, and, and the little picture I found here was when we met uh, in, uh, in Finland back in April 2018. And that was the first time uh, I think we discussed in, in, the, in the ETUC or ETI, uh, in the ETI conference, what uh, could we make a directive on psychosocial risks at work. Um, and, and after that, that is what we have also regularly we keep discussing how could this be part of the solution. And again, I think that the COVID-19 and the teleworking uh, shows us there is a need to do this. And also um, what is, I think you're all aware of is also discussion on the right to disconnect, that you have the right uh, to, to, to not be online on different devices when you're off work. So this is a way of working with the with the problem of of working in your spare time, uh, the problem of of working long hours. Um, but in my perspective, the right to disconnect, the right to not be online, is just part of this. Because why are people working or workers working so much more when they work from home? I think it's also because of of the workload. Um, so it also has we also have to deal with time pressure and workload. And that is, I think we, we deal with that in the in a directive on psychosocial risks. And then we could have the right to disconnect as a part of a, a directive, or it could be its own directive, but they're definitely connected. And, and we need to keep saying that. Um, and finally, of course, we also have the collective agreements on telework, um, as you know, the, the new agreement on digitalization. And I think what is important here is, of course, the implementation of this framework agreement 
in the different member states in the diff between the different social partners uh, and this is also an opportunity to to raise the question of workload of working overtime uh, on the, on the right to disconnect um, so so this is also where uh, we can work on some of these risk factors uh, from working from home yes um also just wanted to share with you i have two slides left uh, i don't know um if well, how much more time i have but uh, i think maybe it's yeah, i'm running out of time but these are just the two slide last slides so first of all uh, this is just a, some good news uh, we have uh, the european parliament employment committee uh, working on on their report on the new uh, eu strategic framework on occupational health and safety uh, and this is uh, part of uh, of of the report it's not it's not uh, it's still on the negotiation so we don't know how it will end but you can see here um that we both have if you look at the, at the the left side we both have the right to disconnect that should be part of a strategic framework the the parliament says and then on the right side you can see they also said a directive on psychosocial risks in in the first line so so here we have the parliament uh, uh going uh, forward with some of our claims that we need to have a directive and 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 we we have a lot of guidelines but we need to move on to some legislation so here is something about what could be the contents of a directive uh if you look at the the green bar here we have the risk factors so what risk risk factors are important to include i'm not going to read them all i think you can you can do that uh uh, when you 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 when you get this presentation, but the green ones are the risk factors in the organization, the way you organize work. So here, of course, we have workload and time pressure, and also work-life balance. Um, and then uh, the risk factors in the red bar are the social or the relational uh, risk factors. And uh, the first one, support from peers and management. Yes, here we know that this is, like I said, is very also very important when you're teleworking. Um, and and finally, we have how to work with psychosocial risk. So that's also a really important part of a directive that we, of course, need to see risk management uh, following the prevention principles. We need workers participation. Management training would be great if we could have something about that and also the use of professional counseling or the professional uh, advice uh, for the enterprises. So this could be something we could use uh, for for the content um, of the directive. So finally, what can we all do uh, to, to, to work on this? First of all, we can keep repeating the need for a directive on PSR whenever and wherever it makes sense. It does help to, to keep repeating it. And uh, I think everybody knows now, uh, the commission, the employers, the governments, that we think we need this. So, but let's, let's uh, help each other keep repeating it. Um, then we can use teleworking and COVID-19 as part of the arguments for a directive, because like I said before, it, it really shows us that there is something that needs to be regulated uh, even more now. And I've only spoken about teleworking now, but of course you could also say the frontline uh, workers uh, that have, have, have such a high workload uh, and the stress among, for example, nurses and doctors. Again, that's arguments we can use for a directive. Um, we can stop talking about PSR as new or emerging risk. I think Amaya also touched upon that this morning. It is an old and well-known risk and it has become more prevalent and easier to spot. So, so let's stop this new and emerging uh, risk with psychosocial risks. Um, and insist on talking about the risk factors in work organization and social interaction. Take the focus away from the individual and and um, and of course the whole mental health uh, uh, way of uh, of speaking is is it can be a bit dangerous. But on the other hand, I don't think we sh we should not uh, we should not uh, not speak about mental health, but we should put mental health in a context of also of psychosocial risks. And of course, argue that a directive on psychosocial risk is possible. Legislation is already a reality in some member states, so it can be done. So the, the fact that we often met with uh, 
statements like this is not possible to regulate, this is too much about relations, this is too much about uh, context, uh, it, it can still be regulated. And I think that's, um, it's, a, it's good to give the floor, I think, then and now to order who will tell us how it's actually re regulated. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing that. So uh, thank you uh, from me. And please do ask questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, uh, really bringing home the message or reminding us that psychosocial risks have existed prior to the pandemic. This is not new, but also that the risks have impacts uh, across sectors and different types of workplaces and, and occupations. Today we talk about telework specifically, but they are a broader issue. Uh, also, very good uh, to, to hear your reflection about the, the, the pros and the cons, so that there are positives and negatives to telework, for example, in terms of work-life balance, that it could uh, telework can give you better control of your hours or your time use, but at the same time, work is everywhere. But it also indicates that telework as such is, is not the problem. It's just how it boils down to how work is organized and regulated. And for that, you then uh, gave us the solutions. What is the way way forward for, for the workers who uh, can and wish to telework to do that in the most uh, healthy way and manner. Um, as you said, now next we have Ord, who will give us uh, an overview of the uh, legal situation of the psychosocial risks um, in, in, the Europe, in, in the European countries. So Ord, please, uh, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, can you hear me well if I speak like that? Great. Uh, so first of all, I have to say that I'm very happy about being part of this panel, of course, but also because I think it has been very well brilliant. So we had first Blondine really putting the context, showing all the effects and all of this, and then Nina emphasizing how it can be done, what is the role at the workplace, all the factors. And uh, now uh, I will finish to put, you know, the final, uh, hammer on the nail with the legal aspect of all of that. So I'm going to touch upon all of this, but with a different length. So my role for the next 20 minutes will be to really focus on psychosocial risk and first within the context of telework and how we can learn from it from COVID and then placing it into the broader European legal framework. So as other speakers said before, uh, and as we have heard already, the pandemic situation has placed a lot of workplaces in the situation to implement, sometimes quite a bit in a rush, in an abrupt manner, telework uh, agreements. And due to the specific societal circumstances that we have heard, especially from Blondine, with, for example, the schools being closed and all of this, that has exacerbated risks that have been already associated with telework before. And that includes psychosocial risks. So the question is, and it has been the question that we, I mean, we have uh, for the entire um, conference is how do we move from that? How do we learn and how do we effectively legally prevent the social <coughs> risk at work in the future agreement where telework will be, we hope, more beneficial to the workers or in majority and only in minority, the risk we're going to underline. And what I wanted to show briefly is the fact that, so, Psychosocial risk is not uh, new, it's, it has been there before, but telework as well. And actually telework and the link with health and safety has been there before. And we find actually echoes between what was underlined sometime like 20 years ago in 2003 by Montreux and Lipel, and what has appeared in the context of COVID uh, in 2021 by uh, Paul Prisco uh, et al. And the three elements for I wanted to emphasize there is first, in both cases, they underline the positive effect and health benefit of telework. Because as we will say for the next, well, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes, we're going to talk about the negative impact. But as Nina said, there are positive ones that we should keep in the back of our head. And this is what we try to reach and it's what we aim. However, in both cases, indeed, there have been always a problem of the workstation, the design, or having a dedicated working area. This is what we can put title or qualify as more ergonomic factors, which is a real problem with musculoskeletal disorders and all of this, which is linked with telework. And not only with telework, which is a problem on its own. 
Then there is, as Nina said, the long working hours that has been already underlined in 2003. And more recently, that was just the general problem of being overworked, which also echo with the right of disconnect of and yeah, logging off. And then last but not least, in 2003, we talked about isolation uh, among the workers to the working. In 2021, this is more generally the social implications. So that has been there, once again, exacerbated by COVID, but it has been there for the past 20 years. And if we do don't anything, it will remain. So the question is, how do we tackle this? And what are the tools that we have in our hands if we look first only at the telework framework? Well, we have the European Framework Agreement on Telework that Nina mentioned that has been adopted in 2002, where here it says clearly that the employer is responsible for the protection of OSH for the teleworkers, and it has to do to protect the workers follow the general principle of prevention of the framework directive that I'm going to uh, highlight in a second. What I think there is no, I think there's no mention of, of psychosocial risk as such in the telework agreement. What it said though, is that the teleworkers and non-teleworkers should be treated equally and their health should be protected in, in an equivalent manner. So it's unacceptable to agree or to, to go with the, the idea or with the practice that teleworkers, because they're far from the work premises, are more exposed to certain works, so certain risks, sorry, that we can identify and we can prevent. And then we have the framework directive where there is a general obligation for the employer to prevent the risk in all aspects of work that should technically uh, or is applicable uh, to the psychological dimension, but without any additional uh, provision. So this is all we have for telework at the EU level. Uh, we can have the right to disconnect, but that's it. But if we look at how the implementation of the framework agreement on telework has been done at the national manner, and once again, this is based on a really old implementation report. So I'm not going to enter into the, the details of the, of the national provision, but we see that there have been four ways of basically implementing this. First, and I think this is acceptable, limiting the application of OSH principle for teleworkers on the basis that the employer do not have access to the workstation or to the place where the worker is performing the work. And that has been the case in some, uh, it has been understood like that in some countries. This is the first case, really not like limited one, but still existed at the time of the implementation report. Then this is a bit of a neutral one uh, where there is guidelines saying like, yeah, yeah, OSH principle apply to telework, no further mention. Then we go for a bit greener uh, with mention within the law at the national level saying that yes, when there are telework, there is an obligation for the employer to prevent every risk in all aspects of work. And then in few countries, little bit, we have extra OSH obligation. For example, the assessment of how the work is designed of the workstation and this kind of things. As of now, nothing, or at least in this implementation report about PSR. However, with COVID, what we have seen, which is interesting for the move further, is that some member states has uh, reformed and has implemented new law, uh, especially when it comes to telework. Problem is, it's not really a problem, uh, but most of them focused on the allocation of the monetary compensation and providing adequate equipment, which, don't get me wrong, is really necessary for the ergonomic impact and all the musculoskeletal disorders, but little attention has been given so far to the psychosocial dimension of telework. There is one exception, which is in Spain, where uh, there have been a law adopted, I think, in 2020, where they say explicitly that the risk assessment should be carried out uh, for the remote employees' workplace, and that includes psychosocial, ergonomic, and organizational factors. So that, that's it so far. So maybe if you have any knowledge about another national law, please let me know. We'd be very happy to know that. Uh, so what, how do we move forward from this? Because clearly about PSR, telework is not the solution. What we can get from this, however, is that the general principle of prevention applies to teleworker and non-teleworkers. So maybe there is a need to address and to prevent effectively psychosocial risk at work for everyone. And here, once again, I move to the European legal framework on psychosocial risk factor. What do we have to address PSR? 
Well, we had this general obligation of Article 5 about every aspect related to work. Then we have two framework agreements, one on work-related stress, uh, 2004, and one on violence and workplace bullying, 2007. But that was framework agreement. They are not directed, and they have been implemented in really different manner at the national level, and I will show you that in a second. Sadly, uh, maybe I'm more pessimistic than Mina here, uh, when we look at the EU strategic framework on health and safety 2021-2027, there is no sign of a willingness to take a, a legislative answer at the EU level when it comes to psychosocial risk, which is, you can say, a problem, and I will show you why it might be. But at the moment, it's clear there is no dedica dedicated legislation to address PSR at the EU level. And the thing is, this is the moment where I show you uh, the problem. Uh, that has been the way PSR are approached currently at the national level is very different and lead to an unequal protection of workers in Europe. So a bit of an explanation, yes, of uh, these maps. So we have been conducted in the effort of trying to understand the situation, a mapping of the national laws, collective agreements and jurisprudence in the European Union. Uh, this is a work in progress. We are currently writing the report. We have received the 26th national report from national experts who tells us exactly the legal provision, the collective agreement and the jurisprudence on PSR. So these maps are basically based on preliminary findings, uh, and you can find them in the recent publication on benchmarking and the OSH uh, chapter, so if you want to find this, uh, this element. And by the way, uh, if you're interested about the details of in each country, we have a webinar uh, end of January about this. So if I go back to this now, what we have is we can see figure 55A, five, five, that these are the countries where there have been just a mention that the OSH general principle of prevention that the employer has to you know, uh, prevent and address the risk at the workplace apply to the psychological or mental health of the workers, nothing more. It's just basically saying, yes, we extend that, but we don't do anything particular or more. Then there is some country that make a step further who actually in their law has prevention and provision about how do we address the PSR factors? How do we address the question of the workload, of the stress, of the tension in a really different manner? Eh? So it's not because the country is colored that they do it uh, thoroughly, but at least there is something in this direction. But as you can see, this is not all the countries in Europe, eh? not at all, far from that. And then if we go a step further, so not only the prevention of sexual risk factors, but when they are a problem, when there is a problem, how do you limit it? it either stress, burnout, or an actual workplace harassment, these are the countries who are something in their law. So the 55C is in their legislation, something about prevention or addressing work-related stress. In 55D, this is legal provision addressing workplace bullying. This is the result of having framework agreement for almost 20 years and the implementation of it. These maps show that this is not enough. So, and I mean, you can say, well, but you know, maybe the general principle of prevention, this is enough in practice. Well, let's see if it is enough in practice. This is the data from SNF3 that has been published in 2020, uh, data collected in 2019, so really recent. And here, this is the percentage of workplaces in Europe, in each country, if they have action plan to prevent work-related stress and to, uh, to proceed to deal with bullying and harassment. I counted roughly. In 23 to 24 countries, the regular risk assessment is systematically higher than the percentage of action plan for work-related stress or and or harassment. What does it mean? It means that even if we have the framework agreement, even if we have the general principle of prevention, even if we have all of that, in practice, they are not addressed. So we need something more because in practice, this is not done apparently, right? So yeah, just to say that there's an actual need. And then how do we, to the question, and I will go back more a bit of what Nina said, how do we reach an effective prevention 
of psychosocial risk factors at the workplace and how do we do that legally? So first of all, the hierarchy of prevention that has been mentioned before, but I will take a shortcut, the employer has a legal obligation to assess the risk. If it's possible, first of all, he has to eliminate the risk or to make substitution for the risk, the risk. Then this is a mitigation of the effect or the exposure uh, that a worker are facing with connective measures. And only then, if it's not enough, you have mitigation uh, of effect and or exposure with individual measures. How does it look like for PSA? Prevention. So here, elimination of the risk, we try to actually reorganize the workplace to avoid unfeasible workload, tension among the team, and guarantee for support from the management. Just as examples, it's a bit to really state what Nina said. Then there is collective measure where we will try to reduce the exposure to psychosocial risk factors. Here, maybe with internal channel of alerts, if there is an excessive workload before burnout, or if there were start to have tension among the team with conciliation, mediation, these kind of things, or when there is a problem with communication with management. And then there is a problem when it's individual, it's a bit too late. Uh, and here we just try to reduce the suffering of the workers exposed to PSR. This is when there are actually workplace bullying. Uh, or there is a case of burnout as examples. Now you're going to tell me like, yeah, we have heard about that. What are the examples? Here are the examples in the different member states in the law in different countries. And here, if you want to know more, especially about the Swedish and the Danish uh, system, this is maybe the, the policy brief that uh, has been published today. But we can see examples. So for the general prevention, for example, 2015 in Sweden, we have uh, the Swedish Work Environment Authority regulation that try and say that we need to prevent an empty workload. And that includes what well, adapting the workload, the task and the resources, but also which is really interesting here is that they stress the importance to train the manager and the supervisor. And it's actually something uh, that we find also uh, in the recent uh, Danish executive order, if I remember well. But then to take another example of how do we reduce the exposure to PSR, here, looking at the Danish uh, executive order, 2020, fairly recent, that provides special provision concerning individual effect. So individual effect, here is understood. We can discuss that in the Q&A, uh, on the psychological work environment. Uh, and it, every time when there is this kind of exposure, the employer has to assess the extent of the exposure and the nature of the exposure and then address it. And then we have the mitigation of exposure with the individual measures. We have also an example in Belgium, but here I took the example of France, where while well, the employer has to prevent the workplace bullying, the author of the workplace bullying might be uh, subject to disciplinary measures. There is mediation possible with the victim and the author of the workplace bullying, and the victim of the workplace bullying is supposed to be protected. So you see, there, there is something. There is something. And why is it so important to deal with that now and for the future? Well, because it has been said before, this is everywhere. So I showed you the risk assessment by country, but this is not only telework. This is not only platform work. This is, this is in all or in a majority of sectors in a form or another. And this is also what Esner underlined. This is prevalent in education, social work, public administration, manufacturing, construction, agriculture. There is everywhere. It, can, it might be not the same thing, but it's a form of PSR. So this is why we have a need to act now in a general manner. And even if we talk about like, you know, teleworking and we have been emphasizing like really the importance of it and how prevalent it is. If we try to see a bit even the future of work, telework, as it has been said by Blandin, this link with the problem of artificial intelligence and the problem of algorithmic management. And PSR is really an important part and dimension of OSH when we talk about new technology and algorithmic management. And this it won't be only platform worker. This is also the case, as Ben say, of the surveillance of people working in office work. This is a problem of people working in, uh, in shops, for example, who now have an app who just monitor how they're moving, the number of pools they're taking, the number of steps they are, they are walking and all of that, and even in factories. So now in factories, even on where you are in the factory, there is like uh, algorithmic <laughs> management who just check if you stay in your position or if you move away from it. So that creates psychosocial risk. It will impact all the sectors more and more in the coming years. So we need to act now. So if 
we just conclude, and I will be fairly in time here, how do we move forward from the lesson learned during COVID, during the telework, and for future way of working in all sectors with all the new technology, where it's clear that psychosocial risk represent a significant risk and that PSR is part of our life. Uh, and we have a need to adequately and effectively pre prevent them in all form of future of work. The need is there. The legal tools, not yet, are not everywhere in sufficient term, because indeed at the moment at the European Union level, we have the general principle of prevention that once again, are really good, and I'm a big fan of the framework directive, so I'm not criticizing this. I'm just saying that we need to have a daughter directive, because what has been always the purpose of all the individual directive is to give specification of how the general principle of prevention should be understood to address a specific risk. This is what has been done for the past 30 years. Why are we not doing this on the same model, extending and providing specification of how to address properly and effectively PSR based on the general principle of prevention. And once again, we have examples at the national level with member states who have done this. Some of them, I think it, in, in Sweden, it has been for decades. Uh, in, in Belgium, it has been also adopted in the 90s. Uh, recently in Denmark, we have examples over time. We can assess it. We are assessing it. There is a base already of discussion that we need to build on. So yeah. This, if it's uh, my call for now and repeating what the other speakers uh, have said, this is an important risk and we need to take action. So this is all the reference and also complementary reading that I think are going to be interesting if you're interested in the topic. And uh, yeah, if uh, you want to talk about it, uh, please feel free. And these are the two publications that has been mentioned as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aude, for your very um, informative uh, presentation. There was a lot to go through and lots of information. And what I'm picking up is it was really the message that the general principle of prevention that applies to all workers uh, is not, um, the principle is not uh, implemented in terms of psychosocial risks or the implementation is, is very fragmented. And therefore, workers are not protected to the same level across countries. So there are clear, clear inequalities, and it goes against the principle. And also that the framework agreements are not uh, not enough. They are not uh, the voluntary approach is not sufficient to to tackle the psychosocial risks. And um, thank you also for linking to the the other presenters' uh, um, uh, key points in terms of really highlighting that we are also talking about the. The, the future of work here and the future of work is here. So, so this, is, this is an acute issue that we need to address now. Um, thank you to all presenters. We can now go to the questions uh, uh, from, from our audience. And I would like to start uh, with uh, a, um, a specific question that taps onto something that I was wondering as well in terms of, um, we, we're talking about, each, uh, a topic that is on one hand very kind of uh, let's say complex on the other hand very straightforward we see it we, we have the data we have the evidence over the years but we are also talking about psychosocial risks at the at the at the institutional level we are talking about legislation and then we are talking about very conceptual level we're talking uh, what is telework what are psychosocial risks and these kind of issues and and to that we have a very interesting question uh, or reflection from uh, Louis Le Rouge who is uh, asking from the panel that would the, the, this, this context be an opportunity to recognize and kind of redefine workload and in particular mental workload? Because in addition to, you could replace the monitoring of working time by an assessment of the workload that would then enable employers to guarantee the necessary rest period for employees. So then you, would, you, wouldn't, um, you wouldn't necessarily adopt any more the strictly quantitative approach to working time, because that's not really effective anymore today. And, and, and in, this, in relation to this, uh, you could think about the right to disconnect, could be the right to disconnect from the issues of working time and rest time. So it, it's not only the, uh, let's say, the traditional approach. So that was a reflection and a question, and I'd, I'd like to hear uh, from, from Nina or uh, who would like to pick up on that question. 
right now? Uh, you want... Yes, please. Yeah, let's do this question first. Yes. Do you mind if I start? It's just a short comment. Okay, so yes, I think it's indeed uh, the perfect moment to do so and to move from a quantitative approach to a qualitative one when in terms of what do we do during the working time. And actually, uh, well, we are going to know more uh, when we're going to reach the, the national reports, basically, but some of them, most of them, talk about psychological strain, about uh, the quality or assessing if the task and the responsibility are not overwhelming. So we start actually in a number of countries at the, at the national level in the law to touch upon more this qualitative assessment of work. And not only working 40 hours, but what do we do during these 40 hours? What do we expect from the workers? And, and being sure that this doesn't represent uh, uh, actually like a, a, a load, uh, I would say like a, a psychological load uh, on the workers. So we are going into this direction. And this is in the moment. And I think Nina will agree with this. This is what needs to appear uh, the day we decide or people decide to dive into the, the uh, directive on GSR. Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, I can I can only add that it it is a bit more complicated than just counting the hours, which I, I see that that is is what what Luke, Luke uh, is also saying, because it's a matter of what you do and the support you get when you do it. How difficult is the task? How much do you have to concentrate? How much support do you have? Do you have the control over the workload? So the the, the sort of the old job demand model is of course really important also. So so I, I totally agree that we need to move away from that and that also makes the assessment more difficult and that's also why if I've, I've just sent you you Audien, you Mayan and you Paula uh, the new Danish guidelines on, on workload and um, and um, uh, work uh, uh, what do you call workload and time pressure that's what it's called in Danish I'm sorry it's in Danish but it, it kind of shows also how difficult this assessment is and how many things that you have to take into consideration. You can't just say if you worked 45 hours, then it's a problem because it's not necessarily a problem. You can work 20 hours and then you have a problem. So, so yeah, so, so I guess uh, I think that's, that's really true. Uh, we need to, it's, it's complicated and it has to be complicated. Thank you, uh, Nina and Ord. Um, I have another question uh, from the audience. Uh, Anna Ribeiro Costa is asking, I think this is for Aud. Um, she's asking that another interesting information would be to know whether the reporting procedures uh, exist, let's say, spontaneously uh, uh, because of collective bargaining, uh, because of collective bargaining, or because the law demands some kind of reporting uh, of the procedures, such as there is a code of contact, conduct, um, which, for example, is the case in, in the Portuguese law. Would you um, would have reflection on, on this one and this kind of, of information or data? Well, good evening, Anna. Uh, thank you very much for your question. And uh, thank you very much for being the expert on the Portuguese situation for, for actually providing this information that we will then report. Uh, yes, no, it's really important because indeed in the... I don't know if it's really addressing what she, she asked, but in the framework directive, there is something, an article saying that the workers should be able to contact the labor inspectorate if they think that there is not uh, enough preventive measures about the health and safety. Maybe it can be understood in psychosocial risks. And indeed, uh, in the mapping that we have been doing, there is something about collective agreement, and we are looking at in all the member states in sectors, if there is actually some reporting mechanisms under what form, if it's something that has to come from uh, the victim, if it's something from the manager. So we are investigating this as we speak, and we will have a definite answer uh, or more specific one in the coming weeks and months. And if I can say something just uh, maybe before about the, the previous comment about the change in the qualitative thing, I'm sorry, I'm just taking the floor I'm holding here. Uh, that also raised the question of the change in the task of the labor inspectorate. Because for a really long time, basically, when labor inspectorate, I think, went to, to the workplaces, it was more of a technical aspect. But then now it's an assessment of how of the managerial 
organization, of the actual work organization, the what you look at, the way you assess it, the way you control, change, I mean, it, it, it changes completely. Yeah? The way you assess the dangerosity of a machine and the dangerosity in terms of mental health and psychosocial risk of an organization does not require the same resources, the same time, and the same training. And this is a discussion we need to have, I think, in parallel, how it changes also the kind of enforcement from labor inspectorate. If I, and if I can just add to that, it's uh, also, I used to be a labor inspector and I used to inspect also psychosocial risk. And it just does take longer time and you need to talk to people, you need to interview workers, you need to interview the managers and you need to make an assessment from when you get all that information and you need to assess, is this too much from what workers are saying? And that in itself can be difficult because you will be met with, this is subjective, this is not objective knowledge, we can't quantify it. But, but then again, we have to insist that what workers say about their own situation, that is also valid knowledge, but it, it kind mm -hmm. of also changes mm -hmm. uh, what, what, you find, what, you, what you think is valid information for the labor inspector to use. And it, it makes it more difficult. And we're still struggling in Denmark after more than 20 years of, of inspecting this, we're still struggling to get the labor inspector to do it because it takes a lot of time. And then they're measured by the amount of inspection they do and the amount of improvement notices. And then, and, and then they end up not doing it. And also the employers complain. And then it's difficult also to maintain uh, the improvement notice when they complain is more difficult than other areas. So definitely I agree that that is something we have to look on in parallel. But just because it's difficult, it shouldn't be said that it can't be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ord and Nina. I see there is a question for Marian. Please, Marian, go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I have a question um, of a more, let's say, maybe conceptual nature. Um, uh, and it's, uh, it refers to Nina's presentation and the, uh, the slide that listed the pros and cons of telework. And I was wondering, um, and my question is, I, I first put the question and then I uh, will um, um, uh, say something about it. Um, do not many pros may turn into cons. Um, no transport. It means no transfer time between work and home. It's longer work and probably also longer working hours. hours. I've heard Several colleagues say that I, uh, since I telework, I make longer working hours because I don't, uh, uh, and it certainly goes for myself as well. Uh, no interruptions versus isolation. I mean, it's nice not to be interrupted, but um, it is also uh, isolation. More efficient use of time, work intensity goes up. Uh, Work-life balance was already in both sides. So that's, uh, and um, a question on top of this is that, uh, shouldn't we um, better specify under what conditions these pros are there? Are these pros really there when we work five days a week, uh, 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 week in, week out, you know, week after week, month after month? Do they, these pros still uh, exist? And um, um, so, so shouldn't we say, um, there are certain conditions to be met in order to arrive to these pros. Of course, this is a research result, Nina, that you present. But uh, the, the question is, has the research been, you know, specified enough to, to, to really make a difference between how many days do we work? Also, under what conditions do I have a good working space? Uh, are my children at home, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you. Yes. Well, well, thank you, Marion. I can only say that I totally agree. And, and maybe, yes, these results are from asking uh, workers these questions. What do you find as being uh, the, 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 the advantages of working from home? And then you give them like, you can tick some boxes. So basically it is not research done where you are really looking into how these uh, risk factors are or factors relate to each other. But I think it's exactly the same as, if, for example, if you look at, uh, if you work, look at workload, if you have too little to do, that's also a problem. 
if you have too much to do, that's also a problem. So this comes with, I think, all the risk factors in, in psychosocial risk. They can, all, they can all be positive and they can all be negative. Uh, or the same with control. If you have too much control, then you actually get too much responsibility of something that you can't, as a worker, take the responsibility for. So, so, so it's it's basically the same thing. It's always about the balance, uh, and and I, I think it's really true. Because and one thing I can say that we also know from your found that I, I didn't have on my slide, we know that the time not spent on transportation is time spent on work. So if you spend that time on taking a walk or uh, actually moving around or doing something else at, at home, but you don't, you or just relaxing, you spend it on working. So that's also part of the reason why uh, workers work more when they're at home. So, so, so I agree that there is pros and cons, uh, different sides to all of this. Uh, so, but I think we still have to accept that there are a lot of workers that think that is, it is an advantage and some workers do live very far from their workplace. So for, for them, it, it is really something to, to save maybe two hours in a car uh, every day. So, 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 so in that sense, I, I think it is still important, but we have to be aware that it also entails risks and it's not just, pos uh, it's not just positive. So, so I hope this answers your question. Yes, it does. I mean, uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's a lot about uh, the the, the uh, specifying uh, the the, the specifying the, the research questions also. I mean, yeah, to 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 make uh, to to make it into a really clear, nuanced picture. I think so. Yeah, but uh, we agree. So that's great. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Marianne and Nina, on the, on, on the reflection. And then I, I think we have time for um, a couple more questions. And I would actually like to uh, bring in the, the, the gender perspective here. And uh, in terms of psychosocial risks, we, we know when we saw the data from ORD that these concern all the sectors. But we do have some sectors that are uh, where the workers are more exposed to these risks. And we're talking about health and care sector, for example, service sector, education, retail. Uh, many of the sectors where majority of the workforce are women. And um, it, it has been um, uh, occupational safety and health legislation, especially at the EU level, has been let's say, criticized to being uh, sometimes very gender blind. It can, it, can, it can address these uh, quantitative um, safety measures that are easily measurable, but struggles, as we just heard, to, to, to address, let's say, psychosocial risks that are more complicated and require more work, like Nina just described, how you, what you need to do as a labor inspector when you go to a workplace, and therefore they are not always addressed. So therefore, I would like to ask from uh, Blandine, uh, from the Gender Equality Institutes, that uh, what are the tools that you, you for example, can uh, provide the European Commission with and the European community in terms of, of addressing uh, gender in, 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 in legislative processes and in policy making? Would you have some reflection for us on that? So first of all, there is, um... There is a very, very strong, it's, it's important to, to, to re remember that um, uh, female dominated professions, you mentioned the healthcare sector, for example, even though a majority of women uh, uh, work there, uh, they are still extremely, um, women don't have access to decision-making positions. And we've seen this in the pandemic very, very uh, much that uh, even though they constitute most of the workers, they are really sidelined when it comes to making the decisions, shaping the, the organization of the work, shaping the, the policies. So this is also one big uh, direction to, to really try to break a bit the glass ceiling and to promote more um, gender balance when it comes to go the government the governance of uh, of the sector so that's one one aspect also to make sure that uh, for example the question in the chat relates to the the emotional work that is linked to those professions that are of caring and the effect it may have on the workers especially on a long-term basis so having a more gender balanced governance and decision making uh, institutions could could be a first step of course also bringing out better compensation I think we have seen, uh, uh, and it needs to be said again and again, that uh, the level of compensation, the working conditions, the, the, um, 
that that characterizes those professions are, are really undervalued and uh, it's really not up to to scratch really so now there, there are quite some hopes with the the, the upcoming um, care strategy from the European Commission. Of course, we are not exactly sure what it will entail, but uh, it is said it will address uh, formal and informal care. So we're really hoping that there, there will be uh, some uh, impulsion towards uh, better salaries, better working conditions, and uh, that of course includes occupational uh, health and, uh, and safety to be continued. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Blandine, for, for your final reflections. And with that, I would like to extend the thank you to uh, all three presenters for giving us a lot of food uh, for thought on what psychosocial risks in telework and beyond are and what do we need to focus on to ensure that this mode of working will be organized in a way that is safe and healthy for workers. Um, with that, I am closing the... Marianne, do you want to give closing remarks or are we just done? Oh, it's just for you, the closing okay. remarks. Okay, very good. Yeah. So okay. it is five o'clock Brussels time now and the conference is now finishing for today. But we look forward to welcoming you back at 9.30 Central European time tomorrow morning when we continue the, uh, uh, the discussion on the annual uh, Occupational Safety and Health Conference. Thank you very much to everyone and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. 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 We did more.